Radio Estros, episode 31, The Illborn. Spoilers all books! Hello and welcome to Radio Westeros. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Lady Guinevere in Boston and with me as ever is Yoke Boy in England. Yeah, hello there. We were and still are working on a double episode on the War of the Five Kings that was promised, but it has rather predictably become really long and complex. And so we've decided to release this episode in the meantime. So today we will be looking at another of the most often mentioned characters not to have a POV, and also like Rob Stark, our previous focus, one of the five kings from which the war takes its name. And we're talking, of course, about Joffrey Baratheon. And what a villain Joffrey is, a character we all love to hate, and what's better than a good villain? This episode will also mark the first time we've covered the Purple Wedding in all its splendor, so stick around and see what we have to say about that. Yes, so a quick look at the structure today. We'll start by considering the making of the monster, Joffrey's youth and formative years before the events of the book's timeline. Then we'll enter a Game of Thrones where Joffrey the Prince becomes an irritant for the Starks and readers alike. And with twists and turns in the drama of King's Landing, Joffrey soon becomes king, and we'll be seeing how he does on the Iron Throne. Then we'll set the scene for the wedding of Joffrey and Marjorie Tyrell, now called the Purple Wedding by fans, as Joffrey is finally undone. And after a walkthrough of the wedding, we'll refine our focus as we investigate the mystery of Joffrey's death. Who did what and why? And so we hope to lay out all the hints and clues to cut through any confusion about the Purple Wedding that you might have. Finally, we'll be doing further Joffrey theory work as we consider who was behind Bran's cat's paw assassin, with Joffrey, of course, being the prime suspect of a couple of characters in story. As always, we'll collect all the pertinent evidence and share it with you organised nicely. Okay, so that's the episode today. Joffrey might not be the most popular character of all time, but given that we did such a close study of another non-point of view character in Rob last time, we think it's well worth analyzing George's villains as well as his heroes. Like we said, we're ending the episode with some interesting theory discussions, and we'll also have a pseudo-advert as well as readings of Arya getting one over on Joffrey at the Trident and the Purple Wedding. And before we get started, we just want to say, if you want to help the show in a way that doesn't cost anything, please remember that our podcast grows almost exclusively through word of mouth. If you tell your friends, mention us on the internet, link to our show, you are doing us a great turn because this is our best chance to find new listeners. Yeah, being a niche show, we're always keen to find new listeners, so anything you can do to help is much appreciated, and thank you for that. And we also want to thank our patrons who support us financially, including our Flaming Lightbringer patron, TJ Harrington, our Dragonsteel patrons, John Wergarian and Peter, and our Pale as Milk Glass patrons, Rosa, Rory, Ashley, Laura, Sister Winter, and Hari Krishna. Thanks to you guys and all our patrons, and visit us on Patreon to see how a pledge per episode can not only support the show, but also earn you certain privileges such as early access to episodes, shout-outs, and patron-exclusive episodes such as the one we have now on Varamir and Skin Changing. So look us up on patreon.com to check out our campaign. And now it's time to get going with Joffrey Baratheon. Joffrey had never had a close friend of his own age that she recalled. The poor boy was always alone. I had Jamie when I was a child, and Malara until she fell into the well. Joff had been fond of the hound, to be sure, but that wasn't a friendship. He was looking for the father he had never found in Robert. Okay, so first of all today, we're going to consider Joffrey's youth and his primary influences, or you could look at this section as the making of a monster. 
when the story begins in A Game of Thrones, he's 12 years old. So what we learn about his upbringing and formative years is actually told in hindsight. In fact, the majority of what we find out about Joffrey's youth is conveyed to the reader after his death. Yeah, George gives us a monster and then later gives us a furthered understanding of his whole character after his death. If this doesn't quite invoke empathy, it at least gives a little pathos to a character who we'll see today was always meant to be despised. With insights from Stannis, the introduction of Cersei's point of view in Feast, and comments from Kevin Lannister, we're still gaining a more nuanced perspective on Joffrey into Feast for Crows and beyond. Yes, we are. And today we'll be trying to follow Joffrey's story from left to right chronologically, which has meant picking up all these small threads drip-fed to us about Joffrey's youth over the course of the novels. George likes to feed us these details on backstory as he sees fit to create reveals and surprises, but we like to unravel these details and prepare them for you listeners from left to right. Okay, so let's start at the very beginning of Joffrey's story, his conception. His mother, Cersei, had been having an affair with her twin brother, Jamie since their teenage years. Here's a quote from that time. He remembered that night as if it were yesterday. They spent it in an old inn on Eel Alley, well away from watchful eyes. Cersei had come to him dressed as a simple serving wench, which somehow excited him all the more. Jamie had never seen her more passionate. Every time he went to sleep, she woke him again. By morning, Casterly Rock seemed a small price to pay to be near her always. Cersei had once found Rhaegar Targaryen very attractive, recalling his beauty and feast. But fate dealt her a different hand as Robert Baratheon killed Rhaegar and took the throne before being paired with Cersei. She recalls finding the new king handsome, but that their wedding night was the only time he ever aroused her. Given we also know he cried out Lyanna's name on that night from the scene with Ned in the Godswood, we can see how that catalyzed a sexually dysfunctional marriage right from the beginning. Yeah, Robert clearly pined for his ex-betrothed, Lyanna Stark, and Cersei recalls that she would think how, quote, the wrong man came back from the trident as Robert was, quote, plowing her. So there was a very unhealthy symmetry in their relationship of both parties yearning for dead flames in an unfortunate parallel. And this inherent incompatibility between Cersei and Robert was exacerbated with mutual infidelity. Robert, as alluded to by Maggie the Frog, sired 16 bastards and so certainly kept himself busy on that front. But Cersei, hurt by Robert's behaviour and in need of comfort and validation herself, turned no further than Jamie, with whom, as we've mentioned, she already had quite a history. And on the subject of infidelity, it's here that Joffrey's story begins, quite literally, as we focus on the royal courtesy visit to Greenstone and Estremont and the cheating of both Robert and Cersei. She recalls it being the longest fortnight of her life, and aside from being a dismal place, her husband began to cheat on her with his own cousin, without making much effort to disguise the fact. We get the story in A Feast for Crows from Cersei. There had been a female cousin, too, a chunky little widow with breasts as big as melons, whose husband and father had both died at Storm's End during the siege. Her father was good to me, Robert told her, and she and I would play together when the two of us were small. It did not take him long to start playing with her again. As soon as Cersei closed her eyes, the king would steal off to console the poor lonely creature. And being so proud, this hurt Cersei, who decided revenge was the best medicine. It says, One night she had Jamie follow him to confirm her suspicions. When her brother returned, he asked her if she wanted Robert dead. No, she had replied. I want him horned. She liked to think that was the night when Joffrey was conceived. So we can see that Joffrey's conception, at least in part, was born from her thirst for revenge over Robert's own infidelity. Joffrey is a child born of spite, we think it's fair to say. 
Later, when Jamie calls Cersei a fool, she thinks, You called me kinder words at Greenstone the night you planted Joff inside me. Here we can see that Cersei is very confident that this is when Joffrey was conceived. And in the previous quote, it's said that she likes to think of that i.e. she's quite proud of herself to this day of conceiving a child with these motives. We don't think the circumstances of birth necessarily correlate to a child's character, but with Ramsay Bolton's backstory and character in mind, we could ponder if George might be conveying that there are bad birthing omens on occasions like these. Okay, so nine months after the wonderful holiday to Greenstone, stylized green shit by Jamie, Joffrey was born in the year 186 AC, prince and heir to King Robert Baratheon in official title, illegitimate bastard of Jamie and Cersei Lannister's incestuous union in truth. And so, we've given a picture of an inherently dysfunctional relationship between king and queen, and the reader can envisage what life must have been like for a child stuck in the middle of those two. While this is largely left to our imaginations, George does give us pertinent information here and there regarding Joffrey's upbringing and relationship with his parents, all three of them. So, in A Clash of Kings, Cersei gives us the briefest insight into Joffrey as a baby. It says, A half-smile flickered across the queen's face. Robert's true-born son and heir. Though Joff would cry whenever Robert picked him up. His grace did not like that. His bastards always gurgled at him happily and sucked his finger when he put it in their little baseboard mouths. Robert wanted smiles and cheers always, so he went where he found them, to his friends and his whores. Robert wanted to be loved. So like we said, this is a very brief passage, but George does a really great job of saying so much with a few words. Baby Joffrey seems to have disliked Robert in contrast to the king's own bastards. Even as a baby, the bond between them simply wasn't there. The insinuation seems to be that there's an incompatibility at an instinctual level with Joffrey because Robert isn't the boy's true father. And the reader can wonder how much this unknown fact shadowed their relationship. Cersei's admission that Robert went elsewhere for his smiles and cheers could denote the beginning of Robert's emotional neglect of Joffrey. And so it seems his parentage was always out of balance. It's possible that a side product of Robert's neglect could have been Cersei responding by spoiling and doting on her child in various ways, perhaps to an unhealthy degree. Yeah, and it's even possible that she actively discouraged Joffrey from bonding with Robert. But at the very least, she seems to have been willfully ignorant of Joffrey's darker side that grew through his youth. There's clear evidence of all this in the story of the pregnant kitchen cat. We get this story from two sources. First, Cersei gives her version, and just a hundred pages later, we get a somewhat differing account from Stannis. Cersei tells Tywin, Robert often told Joff that a king must be bold. And what were you telling him, pray? I did not fight a war to seat Robert II on the Iron Throne. You gave me to understand the boy cared nothing for his father. Why would he? Robert ignored him. He would have beat him if I'd allowed it. That brute you made me marry once hit the boy so hard he knocked out two of his baby teeth over some mischief with a cat. I told him I'd kill him in his sleep if he ever did it again, and he never did. But sometimes he would say things. Yes, so there's this evidence of protection from Cersei there, but also notice that it's a rather light-hearted mischief in Cersei's eyes. And here, in contrast, is Stannis' tale. Joffrey, I remember once, this kitchen cat. The cooks were wont to feed her scraps and fish heads. One told the boy she had kittens in her belly, thinking he might want one. Joffrey opened up the poor thing with a dagger to see if it were true. When he found the kittens, he brought them to show his father. 
Robert hit the boy so hard I thought he'd killed him. Hmm, so Stannis' story shed some horrific light on this mischief with a cat. Joffrey scored positive here on a well-known litmus test for psychopathy in torturing an animal. Exhibiting such behavior at a young age should have had alarm bells ringing, and keeping one eye on Joffrey the king, it's clear to see that sadistic behavior was simply in his DNA, is a serious problem denoting right from wrong. And that's what's shocking about this story. Joffrey didn't realize he'd done anything wrong. In his mind, he was striving for his father's approval with the unborn kittens. Yeah, and parenting techniques are obviously very personal, so it's down to the taste of the individual reader. But in our opinion, the diametrically opposed reactions from Joffrey's parents are comparably wrong and similarly damaging to Joffrey. Knocking two teeth out is really no way to help any young boy who is seeking approval in the worst way. While a sharp lesson might be required, Robert is not helping the child here. On the other hand, Cersei views the cat mutilation as mischief, underplaying the horror, and she's focused solely on Robert's wrongs here in that scene. The takeaway is that while Joffrey was showing signs of being a psychopath, it seems that Cersei and Robert, in their dysfunction, were doing little to steer, check, or guide the boy emotionally. Okay, so let's look closer now at Joffrey's relationships with the information we have about his youth. First of all, there's his younger brother, Tommen. In Feast for Crows, we get this from Jaime and Tommen. The world is full of horrors, Tommen. You can fight them, or laugh at them, or look without seeing. Go away inside. Tommen considered that. I, I used to go away inside sometimes, he confessed, when Joffrey, Joffrey, Cersei stood over them, the wind whipping her skirts around her legs. Your brother's name was Joffrey. He would never have shamed me so. Yes, so Tom and revealing Joffrey used to upset him in some way. There are readers who wonder if this could have been some manner of sexual assault, but our reading is that it's more like standard cruelty and bullying, but it is left to our imaginations by the author. Whatever the case, Cersei's response here is again telling, cutting Tom and short in a typically insensitive manner and lauding Joffrey. And we think it's no coincidence that George designs Tommen to be an animal lover, including cats, which is in complete contrast to his older brother. This difference in their character helps to define them as opposites. And in A Clash of Kings, we learn that Tommen used to have a pet fawn, but Joffrey had skinned her for a jerkin. As an animal lover, this must have been devastating for little Tommen. When we learn of this in Clash, Jason Bywater is telling Tyrion about Tommen's stay at his family estate in the Crownlands. Tommen seems to miss his sister and his mother, Jason says, but, quote, his brother, however, he does not seem to miss at all. Yeah, I'm not surprised. So animals, Tommen and Sansa, all have in common their softness, naivety and innocence. Perhaps these are the sort Joffrey enjoys tormenting the most. Altogether, Tommen seems to have been predictably afraid of Joffrey, and so the question arises from Joffrey's point of view, who was he actually friends with? Well, in A Feast for Crows, we find out. In a conversation with Taina Merriweather about bringing children to court, Cersei thinks Joffrey had never had a close friend of his own age that she recalled, the poor boy was always alone. I had Jamie when I was a child, and Malara until she fell into the well. Joff had been fond of the hound, to be sure, but that was not friendship. He was looking for the father he never found in Robert. So it seems that Joffrey never had a friend, and as Cersei notes, he was always looking for the father who had neglected him. On one hand, Joffrey had this great privilege. He was born into vast wealth and power. He had a tourney on his 12th name day. He would one day be king. All because of the exploits of his heroic father, Robert Baratheon. 
we know from the northern POVs how tales of Robert's deeds had preceded him, the so-called Demon of the Trident, a legend to the Stark children. Can you imagine how it would feel to be that man's young son? Yet for all the glory, as Cersei says, he never found a true father in Robert. So let's look further at Robert and Joffrey. Yeah, and just to add to what we've already said, we've got this from A Game of Thrones. The sellsword king, how the singers would love me. You know what stops me? The thought of Joffrey on the throne, with Cersei standing behind him, whispering in his ear, My son, how could I have made a son like that, Ned? He's only a boy, Ned said awkwardly. He had small liking for Prince Joffrey, but he could hear the pain in Robert's voice. Have you forgotten how wild you were at his age? It would not trouble me if the boy was wild, Ned. You don't know him as I do. So it really pains Robert to talk of Joffrey. We wonder if it's the sadistic streak the king is talking of when he says you don't know him as I do. The irony of Robert wondering how he could have made a boy like that is ultimately lost on Robert, but is later realised by Ned, of course. And we also dug up a quote from Catelyn in Clash, where she observed that she had seen enough of Robert Baratheon at Winterfell to know that the king did not regard Joffrey with any great warmth. We said earlier that Robert and Joffrey not being compatible father and son might be an unconscious reaction to Joffrey having a different biological father, but there's no suggestion whatsoever that Robert had even the slightest suspicion. Such a ruse required complete compliance from the real father, Jamie, who would have risked all their lives if he'd shown any paternal tendencies. Jamie, in this case, seems to have been conveniently eager to sidestep the fatherhood role. He has this exchange with Brienne. Joffrey was your... my king. Leave it at that. You say Sansa killed him. Why protect her? Then he thinks to himself, because Joff was no more to me than a squirt of seed in Cersei's cunt, and because he deserved to die. Aloud, he said, I've made kings and unmade them. Sansa Stark is my last chance for honor. So ultimately, neither of Joffrey's fathers seem to have cared too much for him, even if Jamie's situation turns out to be more complex. And so a rather bleak and isolated picture is being painted of this future king. But there was one person who did love Joffrey, and that was his mother. After his death, Cersei pines for Joffrey almost relentlessly, And whatever mistake she's made as a mother and a human being, we really see the depths of her grief and despair. She often compares Joffrey favourably to Tommen, saying things like, Tommen did as he was bid. His meekness troubled her. A king had to be strong. Joffrey would have argued. And Tommen swiped the tears away with the back of his hand. Jamie had been such a pretty boy, but fierce as well. As fierce as Joffrey, a true lion cub. And these rose-tinted spectacles that Cersei chooses to wear after Joffrey's death, if the cat story was anything to go by, were no doubt being worn throughout the boy's youth. Like we said, there might have been some overcompensation in trying to fill the void left by a neglectful father, which isn't uncommon in such family dynamics. But by now we know about Cersei. She's an unstable, vindictive, and cruel person, and that must have affected Joffrey at both nature and nurture levels, even before we consider the potential role of incest on the boy's personality. And we have some interesting observations about Cersei's parenting from other Lannisters, those who know her best and can be frank and honest. Upon hearing Cersei's toned-down version of the cat story, Tywin says, It appears things needed to be said, before dismissing her, which leaves her absolutely seething. And then we have Kevin, her uncle, The king is my son, Cersei rose to her feet. I, her uncle said, and from what I saw of Joffrey, you're as unfit a mother as you are a ruler. And later he thinks, 
and Circe, the golden child, had grown into a vain, foolish, greedy woman. Left to rule, she would have ruined Tommen as she had Joffrey. So unfavourable remarks there from her own family, with Kevin blaming Joffrey's tendencies directly on Cersei. In truth, beyond the traits he picked up via nature, it took three to make the monster that was Joffrey. As we get ready to discuss his time as a prince from the start of A Game of Thrones, it's useful to keep his youth in mind. There's his doting mother's influence. She who conceived him out of spite and revenge and seems to have allowed his negative behaviours to go unchecked. There's also Jamie, who sometimes views his son as some kind of unwanted byproduct of his incestuous affair and regardless is bound by his Kingsguard duties and his allegiance to Robert and so was warned not to display any emotion towards Joffrey or otherwise risk their lives. And there's his supposed father, an iconic hero who prefers the company of his bastards. This rejection seems to have been felt by Joffrey who appears to crave Robert's attention. Joffrey's attempts to ingratiate himself seem to have pushed Robert further away, perhaps not knowing how to confront Joffrey without hitting him. Cersei claims Robert ignored Joffrey, and in this neglect, Robert, who apparently recognized some of the boy's true character, is also guilty of allowing Joffrey to go unchecked. And when you add in the missing ingredient of real power to the plethora of undesirable traits... You're not looking at a troubled boy anymore, but a potential monster. And this is the story we'll follow today. With this first section, focusing on the probable causes of Joffrey's personality, we hope that you can at least understand what's driving him, if sympathising with him is just a push too far. And with all this in mind, let's enter the events of A Game of Thrones and see how Joffrey's nature and nurture are beginning to manifest as we consider the words and deeds of Joffrey the Prince. What is it, sweet lady? Why are you afraid? No one will hurt you. Put away your swords, all of you. The wolf is her little pet, that's all. And you, dog, away with you. You're scaring my betrothed. The first time we hear Joffrey's name is in the crypts at Winterfell. After establishing the Starks as protagonists, George brings Robert Baratheon into the picture to drive the plot towards a Stark separation. The reader senses Ned's reservations about becoming the Hand of the King, and Sansa is thrown into the stew as Robert also suggests her betrothal to his son Joffrey. I have a son... You have a daughter. My Joff and your Sansa shall join our houses, as Lyanna and I might once have done. This offer did surprise him. Sansa is only eleven. Robert waved an impatient hand. Old enough for betrothal. The marriage can wait a few years. The king smiled. Now stand up and say yes, curse you. Nothing would give me greater pleasure, your grace, Ned answered. He hesitated. So Robert's readiness and impatience is juxtaposed by Ned's hesitance, and this is designed to make us feel an amount of uncertainty about the handship and the betrothal. Even at this early stage, when the crown prince has barely been described, we can sense danger. These deals, to which Ned has little say in all reality, will divide the Stark family, and so Ned's final feeling of a terrible sense of foreboding there in the crypts is not out of place, and generates early tension. And soon after is John's first point of view, in which he does an excellent job of providing early insight into those characters he observes. Here are his first thoughts on Joffrey. He was twelve, younger than John or Rob, but taller than either, to John's vast dismay. Prince Joffrey had his sister's hair and his mother's deep green eyes. A thick tangle of blonde curls dripped down past his golden choker and high velvet collar. Sansa looked radiant as she walked beside him, but John did not like Joffrey's pouty lips or the bored, disdainful way he looked at Winterfell's great hall. 
So we can see evidence of a teenage rivalry that plays out later on, with John being jealous of Joffrey's height and sensing his snobbery at being in the stark home of Winterfell. The physical description of Joffrey as a Lannister is the first clue in hindsight that there might be more Lannister in the boy than King Robert realises. So far, Joffrey has been portrayed as tall for his age and slightly snobbish. Neither are the mark of the beast exactly, yet when Ned and Cat quarrel about the proposed betrothal, we get the first hint that there might be a darker side to the crown prince. Cat says, Robert offers his own son in marriage to our daughter. What else would you call that? Sansa might someday be queen. Her sons could rule from the wall to the mountains of Dorne. What is so wrong with that? Gods, Catelyn, Sansa's only eleven, Ned said. And Joffrey? Joffrey is... She finished for him. Crown prince and heir to the Iron Throne. And I was only twelve when my father promised me to your brother Brandon. So while we never get to hear what Ned was going to say there, we came very close to hearing what he thought about his young royal guest. Despite being left to our imaginations, we think it was probably not going to be complimentary, highlighting the prince's unsuitability for his daughter's hand in marriage in Ned's eyes. And this conversation is soon interrupted by Maester Lewin, bringing Lysa's plot-thickening message about the Lannisters being responsible for Jon Arryn's death. Ned's immediate response is to decide to agree to the betrothal and take Sansa, Arya, and Bran with him to court in King's Landing. Any other action would draw suspicion onto the Starks now. Ned mentions there is, quote, bad feeling between Rob and Prince Joffrey, and other than this information coming from Roger Cassell, details are again left to our imaginations. But it doesn't take long to see the tensions between Rob and the Crown Prince spill over on page in Arya's first POV chapter. Despite acknowledging that Joffrey is attractive, the tall handsome one as she thinks, when Sansa asks her what she thinks of the prince, she only replies that John says he looks like a girl. Now Rob, Arya, John, and perhaps Ned have all exhibited some distaste for Joffrey, and the stage is set for the training yard, where George uses a faux battle setting to underscore the rivalry between Starks and Lannisters. It's a very effective device that acts as a precursor for the later incident with Nymeria and even for the War of the Five Kings. And so, as we highlighted in the Rob episode... There's certainly more to this scene than your usual playground scrap. And the scene begins with Arya wanting to see Rob put gallant Prince Joffrey flat on his back. And even at this early stage, she's thinking for most readers here. When Arya asks Jon why he's not in the yard, his reply that bastards are not allowed to damage young princes might just be one of the most irony-soaked lines in the entire series, showing how clever and playful George can be, seeming to play on two of the series' major mysteries at once, Joffrey's legitimacy and R plus L equals J. After Bran leaves Tommen flapping around on the ground like a turtle, Rob and Joffrey face off with practice swords. Attention is drawn to Joff's spun gold hair, building up to Ned's later discovery. And now the reader gets to know Joffrey Baratheon for themselves. The prince is immediately condescending, commenting that this is a game for children, Sir Roderick, despite being a child himself at 12 years old, as Theon points out. And the scene continues. Rob may be a child, Joffrey said, but I'm a prince, and I grow tired of swatting at Starks with a play sword. You got more swats than you gave, Joff, Rob said. Are you afraid? Prince Joffrey looked at him. Oh, terrified, he said. You're so much older. Some of the Lannister men laughed. Yes, so Joffrey is unquestionably annoying there, patronising and arrogant, and when John comments to Arya that Joffrey is truly a little shit, no amount of our deconstruction and analysis could ever really top that observation. No, that's pretty true. It sums it up in just a few words there. 
However, we'd like to point out that at 12 years old, Joffrey is not subject to the same boy-to-man arc that Rob faces at the age of 14. There's a significant difference in their ages, and as such, Joffrey's and Rob's arcs need to be distinguished, with Joffrey being more the boy, whereas Rob's arc asks us what is the difference between a boy and a man, Joffrey's arc begins to ask arguably more troubling questions like, how much can we hate this child? Can we ignore the age of this villain? And ultimately, how much can we cheer the death of a boy? And this minor irritation in the training yard is really the start of a turbulent relationship between not just Joffrey and the Starks, but between Joffrey and the reader, exploring those aforementioned difficult questions. After his sarcasm humiliates Rob, who ultimately needs to be restrained, here's the prince's reaction. Joffrey feigned a yawn and turned to his younger brother. Come, Tommen, he said. The hour of play is done. Leave the children to their frolics. Yeah, so in just a brief scene, Joffrey really introduces himself to the reader, stirs emotions, and you have to give George credit here for such a skillfully designed boy villain. He maximized irritation levels in such a neat and compact manner, and the tension Joffrey creates is part of a very important tapestry of groundwork for this book and the series as a whole. Now this Stark versus Lannister tension is kind of harmless so far, but things take an horrific turn when Bran listens in on Cersei asking Jaime, what happens when Robert dies and Joff takes the throne? And the sooner that comes to pass, the safer we'll all be. My husband grows more restless every day. So, the thought of Joffrey succeeding Robert is planted. The reader gets confirmation of the sexual relationship between the Lannister siblings. And then, Jamie attempts to murder Bran, leaving the boy comatose and crippled. In the aftermath, it's notable that Sandor and Joffrey discuss Bran dying, with the Hound saying, The boy is a long time dying. I wish he'd be quicker about it. Remembering that Joffrey really looks up to this man... Tyrion enters the scene and suffers mocking from Sandor before his nephew refuses his request to provide comfort to the Starks. The Stark boy is nothing to me, Joffrey said. I cannot abide the wailing of women. Yeah, and Tyrion slaps Joffrey, to which Joffrey responds with threats to tell mother. So the imp slaps him again. It's a surprising moment that aims to make us like Tyrion more and Joffrey even less and really succeeds on both counts. Seeing Tyrion as a side from the other Lannisters is crucial at this stage. He has to be the likeable Lannister for balance and to add some complexity to the kidnapping of the imp later on. The cries for his mother poke a hole in Joffrey's bravado, really for the first time. Again, we see the boy in the prince. And finally, it's a setup on another level for the Tyrion Joffrey rivalry. And these tensions carry all the way forward until the very end of Joffrey's story. You tell your mother, Tyrion told him. But first, you get yourself to Lord and Lady Stark, and you fall to your knees in front of them, and you tell them how very sorry you are, and that you are at their service if there is the slightest thing you can do for them or theirs in this desperate hour, and that all your prayers go with them. Do you understand? Do you? The boy looked as though he was going to cry. Instead, he managed a weak nod. Then he turned and fled headlong from the yard, holding his cheek. Tyrion watched him run. The prince will remember that, little lord, the hound warned him. I pray he does, Tyrion Lannister replied. If he forgets, be a good dog and remind him. And we find out in A Feast for Crows that soon after this, Joffrey heard his father drunkenly talking about giving Bran a mercy. 
We'll investigate the cat's paw situation later on, but for now, let's suspend any disbelief and assume that Jamie and Tyrion reached the correct conclusion, that Joffrey did indeed hire the cat's paw from the band of camp followers in a misguided attempt to impress his father. This not only speaks to Joffrey's cold, calculating, and psychopathic manner to orchestrate this at such a young age, but it also underlines the effects on him of Robert's distance as a father. Joffrey behaving bizarrely in order to impress Robert has already been mentioned with the Kitchen Cat episode, and if the king had found out about Joffrey hiring the cat's paw, we can guess his punishment would have been far more severe than the hit in the mouth that the mutilated cat earned him. Yeah, in fact, if the cat's paw had lived and given up Joffrey's name, there would have been huge consequences and his story would have no doubt been very different. But for all the what-ifs, Joffrey never had to face any consequences, although the same cannot be said for Bran Stark, and this conspiracy drove the plot towards the War of the Five Kings. But it's worth keeping in mind that this all spills out much later in the books, and in Game of Thrones itself, as far as anyone knows, Joffrey still hasn't done anything completely terrible. And one character that actually takes a shine to him is his betrothed Sansa Stark. Almost immediately in her first point of view chapter, we get this. Sansa did not really know Joffrey yet, but she was already in love with him. He was all she ever dreamt her prince should be, tall and handsome and strong, with hair like gold. She treasured every chance to spend time with him, few as they were. The only thing that scared her about today was Arya. Arya had a way of ruining everything. You never knew what she would do. So it was clearly of some importance that one of the Starks fell for the arrogant charm of the Lannisters. This dynamic provides no end of plot possibilities and adds some complexity to proceedings. Sansa, here an 11-year-old girl, is the young lady of the story, dreaming of knightly tales, kissing princes and courtly romance. Having been shaped to be a lady from a young age by people like Septa Mordain, Sansa's refinement has unfortunately encouraged a naivety in her, something she suffers greatly for through the story. Sansa's delicate, soft nature not only sets her at odds with Arya, but as the story progresses, she becomes a great foil for the cruelty of Joffrey, as we'll later see. For now, we must understand Sansa's attraction to Joffrey. Aside from this courtly brainwashing we've mentioned, and the fact that he is a prince, Joffrey does know how to be charming and regal, at least in the eyes of an 11-year-old girl. When Sansa becomes upset in the company of Sandor and Sir Elan Payne, it's Joffrey who appears as she's on the verge of tears. Leave her alone, Joffrey said. He stood over her, beautiful in blue wool and black leather, his golden curls shining in the sun like a crown. He gave her his hand, drew her to her feet. What is it, sweet lady? Why are you afraid? No one will hurt you. Put away your swords, all of you. The wolf is her little pet, that's all. He looked at Sander Clegane. And you, dog, away with you. You're scaring my betrothed. And soon, Renly calls Sansa wolf girl in a light-hearted moment, but Joffrey once again jumps to her defense. It says, Joffrey stiffened beside her. Have a care how you address my betrothed. Okay, so in reality, Joffrey isn't exactly putting his life on the line for Sansa. But through her lens, we can see how in these moments, Joffrey might have appeared chivalrous and very brave. She thinks that her quote-unquote rescue was almost like the songs. With Joffrey raising Sansa's spirits and her previous thought that Arya was the only thing that scared her about the day as she had a way of quote ruining everything, the stage is set for the showdown at the Trident. Yeah, and it's actually Cersei who sets up this date, if you will, telling Joffrey to entertain their guest for the day. 
And, not uncommon for a psychopath, Joffrey comes across as courteous and polite despite the occasional slip of the facade, where he looks at Renly with pure loathing and seems unusually annoyed at the hound. Sansa, caught up in the romance of the moment, with his hand touching hers, doesn't dwell on such moments, though she does recognize it, showing the bias of her starry-eyed naivete. And following the training yard incident, Joffrey continues to embody an arrogant bravado, all revolving around his new shiny sword, which in context represents the path into manhood. For Joffrey, proving his manhood is evidently very important, and that he chooses to do so by discarding his sworn hound and embracing the protection of his own steel, called Lion's Tooth, is further evidence of a boy who would like to be seen in the same light as his father. Unfortunately for him, Robert Baratheon was both peerless and able to befriend his staunchest enemies, and so Joffrey is really setting himself up for failure with his swaggering facade here. But pride cometh before the fall, and he shows off a lion's tooth in all its glory, Sansa is prone to be impressed by superficial things, and at this stage that works for both the sword and for Joffrey. The pair go on to have a great day, riding, eating fish from the river, and exploring. Even with Joffrey around, it seems very idyllic, and Sansa describes it as a magical day. Yes, such magic. When the pair begin to drink wine, and Sansa consumes more than she's ever had before, naughty girl, we're reminded that these are two children playing at being adults. Joffrey points out the spot where Robert crushed Rhaegar, and so we can imagine his intoxicated pride when at precisely that moment the pair hear a commotion. Joffrey now has everything to prove to his lady and reassures her that you're safe with me. He laughs when he sees it's Arya sword fighting with the boy Micah using wooden sticks. And Joffrey now plays the bully, mocking Micah for fighting with a young girl and using lion's tooth to cut the boy, who finds himself in a really terrible situation. Soon Arya hits Joffrey on the back of the head with her stick, and he chases after her, slashing with his live steel, clearly unaware of his hypocrisy given his previous mocking Micah for fighting little girls. Yeah, we'll have a full reading of this scene later. But after the initial confrontation, chaos ensues. Micah runs away. Sansa describes Joffrey's rage as terrible and he is screaming curses. Then as he has Arya backed up against a tree beneath his sword point, Nymeria bites Joffrey's hand. And after calling off her pet, Aya picks up Lion's Tooth and throws it into the middle of the river. So, the latter act, given the sword as a symbol of coming of age established all the way back in the trading art scrap, might highlight what George thinks of Joffrey's adulthood. Joffrey's sword being flung away is a rejection of any notion that this character is a man ready for battles of any kind. Set this against the acceptance of Rob carrying live steel and wielding it in this book, and you can see a gulf between these two characters as eventual leaders. Joffrey is given three fine-looking blades in this story, and he bloodies none of them. And in this scene, Sansa is really asked to choose between her betrothed and her own sister, establishing important dynamics that continue through her arc. Micah is set to learn what it means to be a small folk against a prince, and Arya shows her mettle by removing Lion's Tooth from the story. Incidentally, in A Storm of Swords, Arya misremembers the name of Lion's Tooth as being called Lion's Paw, which George has said is part of a realism device called the Unreliable Narrator, used here to make the experiences of characters more believable in their fallibility. Anyway, the scene ends with Sansa nursing Joffrey. He might be a terrible person who brought this upon himself, but can you imagine the shame and humiliation he must have been feeling? Half an hour ago, he was a proud prince talking about his father's antics on the trident. 
legendary heroics known throughout the kingdom, and almost in the exact location where Rhaegar lost his rubies, Joffrey loses his sword to a nine-year-old girl and her wolf, and all this when he was trying so hard to impress his Lady Sansa. The whole scene was an emasculating affront to his maturity, and given the flashes of bitterness we've seen up to now, it's no wonder the chapter ends like this. His eyes snapped open and looked at her, and there was nothing but loathing there, nothing but the vilest contempt. Then go, he spit at her, and don't touch me. Mm, Describing a child in these terms, with perceived loathing and vile contempt, it's now obvious to the reader that Joffrey is not typical. There is something dark and menacing in him that sets him aside from the emotional range of other children we've been introduced to. When the events are ultimately brought before the adults at Darry, Aya and Joffrey give two very different versions of events, with the prince's tale being particularly removed from the truth. Joff is clearly under the wing of his mother, Ned is lenient to Aya, and in the middle is King Robert, who seemingly would rather be anywhere else. And when Arya tells of throwing Lion's Tooth into the trident, Renly begins to laugh and is asked to leave by Robert. Perchance you'll tell me later how a nine-year-old girl the size of a wet rat managed to disarm you with a broom handle and throw your sword in a river. As the door swung shut behind him, Ned heard him say, Lion's tooth, and guffaw once more. (laughs) Yes, it is a humorous moment, isn't it? And you'll be forgiven for laughing at Joffrey here, I think. As readers, we're invited to mock the prince. But he will have the last laugh soon enough. Sansa is invited to give testimony, but won't support her sister, causing an enduring rift in the Stark camp. Cersei reminds Robert that Nymeria must be punished, but in her absence, it's Sansa's lady who must pay the price. Amidst the smugness of the queen and the wailing of the sisters, it says that Prince Joffrey was smiling. And for what it's worth, Robert later confesses to Ned that he was convinced Joffrey was lying here all along. So, with the execution of Lady and the similarly innocent Micah on account of Joffrey's testimony, the reader now has an irreversible distaste for the Crown Prince, and more groundwork is laid for the War of the Five Kings. Okay, and weeks later, at the Hands Tourney, Joffrey talks to his betrothed for the first time since that Darry incident, and we see Sansa blame Cersei and Arya for the incident, allowing her to love her prince once again. As we've said, she's smart enough to see Joffrey for who he really is, yet tends to delude and blind herself with idealizations. Here's a quote. She could not hate Joffrey tonight. He was too beautiful to hate. He wore a deep blue doublet studded with a double row of golden lion's heads and around his brow a slim coronet made of gold and sapphires. His hair was as bright as the metal. Sansa looked at him and trembled, afraid that he might ignore her or, worse, turn hateful again and send her weeping from the table. Instead, Joffrey smiled and kissed her hand, handsome and gallant as any prince in the songs. So again, we see a charm offensive from Joffrey. He goes on to act extremely well-mannered as they feast on snails, fish and meat. And as a young lady, this obviously appeals to her enough to sustain her willful ignorance. So mesmerized by the notion of a future that she was essentially raised for, Sansa is too forgiving towards Joffrey, something for which she'll pay a heavy price. Leaving his dog, Sandor, to escort Sansa rather than take her home herself, it's clear by now, to the reader at least, that Joffrey's courtesy is completely and utterly superficial. Unfortunately for her, as Peter Baelish would warn, Sansa will soon learn that life is not a song. In the meantime, Ned investigates the John Arryn mystery and soon realises that Joffrey is no Baratheon, but the product of Jamie and Cersei's incestuous union. George has given enough reason for us already to despise Joffrey, but with his illegitimacy, he becomes a walking symbol of Lannister treachery. Knowing his power is false, 
only deepens our anxiety about him ever becoming king. And when Robert lays dying after his ill-fated hunting trip, of which Joffrey was an attendee for what it's worth, Ned's doctoring of his will feels like a shield to the realm. However, Ned soon learns the value of paper shields, and with Robert's passing and Ned's arrest, Joffrey becomes the king, with Cersei assuming the regency until the boy comes of age. So far, we've seen Joffrey act like a spoiled boy, displaying petulance, arrogance, and vindictiveness. Beyond this, his cutting of Micah's face and smiling upon hearing Lady was to be put down show us something more troubling about Joffrey, his sadism. With Cersei as his mother and regent, the reader can sense that Joffrey's reign will not be pretty. In the next section, we'll see what happens when the sadistic boy prince we've come to loathe inherits real power and becomes the king. First, here's that reading we promised, where Joffrey is humiliated by Arya and Nymeria on the trident. I won't hurt him. Much. Prince Joffrey told Arya, never taking his eyes off the butcher's boy. Arya went for him. Sansa slid off her mare, but she was too slow. Arya swung with both hands. There was a loud crack as the wood split against the back of the prince's head, and then everything happened at once before Sansa's horrified eyes. Joffrey staggered and whirled around, roaring curses. Micah ran for the trees as fast as his legs would take him. Arya swung at the prince again, but this time Joffrey caught the blow on Lion's Tooth and sent her broken stick flying from her hands. The back of his head was all bloody and his eyes were on fire. Sansa was shrieking, No! No! Stop it! Stop it! Both of you! You're spoiling it! But no one was listening. Arya scooped up a rock and hurled it at Joffrey's head. She hit his horse instead and the blood bay reared and went galloping off after Micah. Stop it! Don't! Stop it! Sansa screamed. Joffrey slashed at Arya with his sword, screaming obscenities, terrible words, filthy words. Arya darted back, frightened now, but Joffrey followed, hounding her toward the woods, backing her up against a tree. Sansa didn't know what to do. She watched helplessly, almost blind from her tears. Then... A gray blur flashed past her, and suddenly Nymeria was there, leaping, jaws closing around Joffrey's sword arm. The steel fell from his fingers as the wolf knocked him off his feet, and they rolled in the grass, the wolf snarling and ripping at him, the prince shrieking in pain. Get it off! Get it off! Arya's voice cracked like a whip. Nymeria! The wolf let go of Joffrey and moved to Arya's side. The prince lay in the grass, whimpering, cradling his mangled arm. His shirt was soaked in blood. Arya said, She didn't hurt you. Much. She picked up Lion's Tooth where it had fallen and stood over him, holding the sword in both hands. Joffrey made a scared, whimpery sound as he looked up at her. No, don't hurt me. I'll tell my mother. You leave him alone! Sansa screamed at her sister. Arya whirled and heaved the sword into the air, putting her whole body into the throw. The blue steel flashed in the sun as the sword spun out over the river. It hit the water and vanished with a splash. Joffrey moaned. Arya ran off to her horse, Nymeria loping at her heels. Okay, we hope you like that reading of Arya drowning Lion's Tooth there, and now for a look at Joffrey the King. As King Robert lay dying, having committed to his will that Ned would take up the regency, the Northmen had a candid exchange with Littlefinger, who suggests this. Joffrey is but twelve, and Robert gave you the regency, my lord. You are the hand of the king and protector of the realm. The power is yours, Lord Stark. All you need do is reach out and take it. Make your peace with the Lannisters. Release the imp. Wed Joffrey to your Sansa. Wed your younger girl to Prince Tommen and your heir to Myrcella. It will be four years before Joffrey comes of age. By then, he'll look to you as his second father. And if not, well, four years is a good long while, my lord. Long enough to dispose of Lord Stannis. Then, should Joffrey prove troublesome, we can reveal his little secret and put Lord Renly on the throne. Okay, and Ned... 
dismisses the idea as treason, believing Stannis Baratheon to be the rightful heir. But what's interesting in our study of Joffrey is Littlefinger's hint that he believes the prince might become trouble, something he's clearly given some amount of thought to, ultimately viewing him as a pawn. But that's not all Littlefinger has been pondering on. As Ned enters the throne room to be confirmed as protector, he doesn't realise he's about to be betrayed by the very man who warned him not to trust him. It's now we get our first glimpse of Joffrey on the Iron Throne, and Ned thinks of him as the boy who called himself king, and wonders if he'll step down as easily as Jamie did all those years ago. Here's the description of Joffrey. Above them, Prince Joffrey sat amidst the barbs and spikes in a cloth of gold doublet and a red satin cape. And here's the first words we hear from Joffrey on the throne. Joffrey stood. His red satin cape was patterned in gold thread, fifty roaring lions to one side, fifty prancing stags to the other. I command the council to make all the necessary arrangements for my coronation, the boy proclaimed. I wish to be crowned within the fortnight. Today I shall accept oaths of fealty from my loyal counsellors. So Joffrey seems regal enough, and soon his mother is tearing up Robert's will. Cersei loves power, and in her mind she can use the position of regent to leverage her wants and needs and go a large way towards satiating her need for control. Cersei's actions spur Ned on to publicly allude to Joffrey's illegitimacy. This claim is treason if untrue, and we see Joffrey shout liar with his face reddening. Yeah, and soon he's shouting, kill all of them, I command it. And Ned's numerical advantage is overturned by Littlefinger's treachery, an eventful first public performance as a king from Joffrey. And with Ned in the black cells and Sansa naively trying to heal the situation, there's another eventful performance from Joffrey in his first council meeting. Lord Commander of the King's Guard, Barristan Selmy, is dismissed from his post, with Joffrey accusing him of being too old and of letting his father die. This maneuver, on the face of it, looks to suit Joffrey, as the Hound gets a white cloak, and, aside from Cersei getting to empower Jaime, we later learn it was Varys who had manipulated the dismissal for reasons entirely of his own. Yeah, and that's a characteristically poor decision to let Barristan go there. And later, Sansa pleads her forgiveness, with Joffrey once more turning on the charm like a switch. King Joffrey looked her up and down. Your sweet words have moved me, he said gallantly, nodding, as if to say all would be well. I shall do as you ask, but first your father has to confess. He has to confess and say that I am the king, or there will be no mercy for him. So, with Ned preparing to give up his honour, with a deal struck for him to take the black, the details worked out by Varys and Littlefinger, it's now that Joffrey really comes into his own as a king. On the day appointed for Ned's public confession, Joffrey had other ideas. My mother bids me let Lord Eddard take the black, and Lady Sansa has begged mercy for her father. But they have the soft hearts of women. So long as I am your king, treason shall never go unpunished. Sir Illyn, bring me his head. Yet this was Joffrey acting without regard for consequence or conscience, beheading the father of his own betrothed in front of her and letting her think that he was going to show mercy. While there is some suggestion from the text and from the fandom that Littlefinger might just have whispered in Joffrey's ear there, either way, he certainly relished this cruel moment. Cersei, who must have thought she was in control, is helpless to stop her son unleashing the might of the North on the Lannisters in one fell swoop. With the problem of Joffrey's illegitimacy already a concern for the crown, the War of the Five Kings has now been greatly hastened by the rashness of their new king, and this was plainly avoidable. 
Yes, it was, and it's now that the Joffrey Sansa juxtaposition takes full effect. His unconscionable cruelty against her innocence often makes for a painful read. Upon hearing that she's to remain betrothed to Joffrey, he soon argues that he did in fact show mercy to Ned because he'd considered flaying him. He concedes that a king should not hit his wife, and so he orders Marin to hit her with a gloved hand. Coming into power has unleashed Joffrey's cruelty, and unfortunately for Sansa, her torment is only beginning. No longer the pompous irritant, Joffrey the king has brought immediate terror to the story, which, for the reader at least, preserves a sense of urgency in Rob's campaign, even in the wake of Ned's death. And we get another example of Joffrey's brand of mercy when he presides over a musician who'd sung a song mocking Robert. The new king decides to show his mercy and lets the singer choose between the removal of his fingers or his tongue. In Ned's arc, we saw what he called the madness of mercy. In his case, it was for children. In Arya's arc, there will later be an examination of mercy operating on numerous levels. But here with Joffrey, we're witnessing a character so uncompassionate, he can barely comprehend what true mercy means. He cuts off hands in court, orders two knights to fight to the death over a rather petty dispute, and condemns a woman for wanting her lover to be buried respectfully, all in a single session. Whatever the reader concluded about Robert, King Joffrey is quickly shaping up to be a tyrant more akin to the Mad King Ares, with whom he shares this sadistic streak. When Littlefinger had remarked to Ned that Joffrey could become unruly in his four years as regent, could even he have suspected the carnage of just the first few weeks here? I think few could have predicted that. And now to heighten the torment, Joffrey begins to emotionally abuse Sansa more than ever before, now bringing in the threat of sexual encounters. I'll get you with child as soon as you're able, Joffrey said as he escorted her across the practice yard. If the first one is stupid, I'll chop off your head and find a smarter wife. When do you think you'll be able to have children? And all of this obviously plays into some really deep fears for us readers. Joffrey then forces Sansa to gaze at the heads of her own father, Septimor Dane, and others. Sansa's resolve that she will look but not see suggests some inner fortitude. And that's really the only scant consolation here. The whole passage is very disturbing, but when Joffrey promises her Rob's head, Sansa says defiantly, maybe my brother will give me your head. Coupled with Joffrey's unintentionally humorous boast that he will kill Rob himself, these moments of defiance make these passages more palatable to the reader. Yet George never lets Joffrey remain beaten for too long, and often brings us more torment following these brief moments of catharsis. We all gained satisfaction at the trident, but that was followed by the death of Lady. In this instance, Sansa's encouraging defiance earns her another beating, and for the briefest moment she contemplates knocking Joffrey and his wormy lips over the parapets to his death. This would have meant certain death for Sansa one way or the other, not for the first time, Sander Clegane steps in to guide Sansa away from any further trouble, beginning a curious Beauty and the Beast type story between the captive and the Sorn Sword. And just when it seems like there's no one to bring Joffrey to heel, we hear of Tywin's discontent at the situation. What sort of counsel are they giving Joffrey when he lurches from one folly to the next? Whose notion was it to make this Janos Slint a lord? The man's father was a butcher, and they grant him Harrenhal. Harrenhal, that was the seat of kings. Not that he will ever set foot inside it, if I have a say. I am told he took a bloody spear for his sigil. A bloody cleaver would have been my choice. His father had not raised his voice, yet Tyrion could see the anger in the gold of his eyes. And dismissing Selmy, where was the sense in that? 
Yes, the man was old, but the name of Barristan the Bold still has meaning in the realm. He lent honour to any man he served. Can anyone say the same of the hound? You feed your dog bones under the table. You do not seat him beside you on the high bench. He pointed a finger at Tyrion's face. If Cersei cannot curb the boy, you must. And so Tywin sends Tyrion to King's Landing to rule, which, given Joffrey and Cersei's aversion to him, will predictably have dramatic effect on the dynamics in the capital. As we enter a clash of kings, it's Joffrey's name day, and one of the first things we're told about him is that he's gifted Sansa a moonstone hairnet. Hmm. And other gifts from Joffrey included a long-sleeved gown, perfect for hiding her bruised arms. After news of Rob's crowning had reached the capital, it seemed the Kingsguard were utilised once more. Casting our minds back to the childish training yard incident at Winterfell, it's interesting to consider that the two opponents are now kings. We've covered Rob Stark extensively and looked at his leadership, how he inspired his men and how his sense of honour affected his decisions. Joffrey, albeit younger than Rob, displays little in the way of leadership, fails to inspire even by fear and has no honour to speak of. While Rob being the good king and Joffrey the bad might be a lazy and oversimplified takeaway from this complex series, there is an undeniable hero versus villain study here that can be extrapolated into our general feelings about House Stark and House Lannister at this stage in proceedings. And while Rob is growing into a capable leader of men, using his power for a cause, Joffrey continues to use his power for his own entertainment and to settle petty scores. We come to learn that five of the King's Guard have beaten Sansa. This is now a routine, and given the catalyst seems to be Rob's victories, it seems Joffrey's pride is very easy to wound. Responding with this cowardly violence against Sansa makes us wonder if Joffrey's rather fragile ego could be related to a form of narcissism, given other symptoms include lacking empathy, requiring excessive admiration, and having a grand sense of entitlement. Yeah, it does seem like Joffrey might fit that bill all too well. And at the name day tourney, we see Sansa's observation when Joffrey Baratheon's mood darkened, any chance word might set off one of his rages ring true again as he orders the drowning in wine of Dontos Hollard. Sansa's plea is an important moment, we think. It highlights her subtle resistance to Joffrey's cruelty. Also, she saves Dontos, who rather poetically is involved in Joffrey's downfall later on. And ultimately, the Hound joins Sansa in the manipulation for Dantos' life. Again, it's subtle, but the fact that Sansa has found some kind of friend is very important to her as a character and to us as readers who are appalled by her ongoing mistreatment. Sansa's off-the-cuff comment that He is a fool. You're so clever to see it plays to Joffrey's aforementioned narcissistic streak, and shows one way of controlling this young monster is to flatter and appeal to his ego. And soon Joffrey is laughing the loudest when his own little brother could have been badly hurt when riding against the Quintain. When Sansa remarks on the fact, Joffrey replies, What if he is? And it's now that Tyrion enters the scene, giving us welcome relief in the way he treats Sansa with some respect and Joffrey with some disdain. When Sandor warns, I'd guard that tongue of yours, little man, the reader already has Tyrion pegged as the most unguarded tongue in all of Westeros. As acting hand, though, Tyrion is not simply here to cause trouble. As he says to Cersei, you need me whether you care to admit it or not. Your son needs me if he's to have a hope of retaining that ugly iron chair. 
Yeah, the Lannister family know they must stick together to retain power, given Renly and Rob and now Stannis are calling themselves kings, with rumors about to be put into circulation about Joffrey's legitimacy. With Joffrey shown to be spending his time killing, or at least trying, to kill hares with his crossbow, and Cersei increasingly being portrayed as inept, Tyrion must seek to prepare a defense of King's Landing. And the hares aren't the only animals Joffrey seeks to harm, as Sansa is later taken to him and sees a yellow cat was dying on the ground, mewling piteously, a crossbow quarrel through its ribs. So more sickening behaviour and signs of a psychopathic mind there. Sansa is revolted, but ultimately has greater concerns as Joffrey, crossbow in hand, seeks to punish her for Rob's victory at Oxcross. Yeah, he points the crossbow at Sansa's face and threatens her. It's thus far been a sadistic toy, but inevitably with Joffrey, the threat has escalated, and we learn that he's already killed the man with it. In a prelude to the bread riots, Joffrey boasts of how he shot a hungry protester in the throat. He wants to kill Sansa, too, but has been ordered not to by his mother, a rare show of self-restraint. Instead, he has Sansa brutally beaten. Yes, we have the passage here. Boros slammed a fist into Sansa's belly, driving the air out of her. When she doubled over, the knight grabbed her hair and drew his sword, and for one hideous instant she was certain he meant to open her throat. As he laid the flat of the blade across her thighs, she thought her legs might break from the force of the blow. Sansa screamed, tears welled in her eyes, it will be over soon. She soon lost count of the blows. Enough, she heard the hound rasp. No, it isn't, the king replied. Boros, make her naked. Boros shoved a meaty hand down the front of Sansa's bodice and gave a hard yank. The silk came tearing away, bearing her to the waist. Sansa covered her breasts with her hands. She could hear the sniggers, far off and cruel. Beat her bloody, Joffrey said. We'll see how our brother fancies. What is the meaning of this? The imp's voice cracked like a whip, and suddenly Sansa was free. So again, we see some dissent and support of Sansa from the Hound, but it was Tyrion who saved Sansa here from an increasingly sexualized torture. We said earlier that Tyrion's arrival in King's Landing would change dynamics, and here's evidence of that in full force. He's an essential check and balance to Joffrey's wildness, and despite being vulnerable physically, he has shown no fear about confronting his nephew since that slapping scene at Winterfell in A Game of Thrones. Sansa's resistance to Joffrey usually carries subtlety and passivity, but Tyrion's resistance is confrontational, commanding, intelligent, and often amusing, and so he really makes a great foil amidst the persistent acts of mindless cruelty. In this instance... Tyrion scolds Meryn and Boros before telling Joffrey, you have the wits of a goose. Yes, and I think I'd agree with Tyrion there. He is always getting one over on Joffrey, who I have to say is more cunning than smart, perhaps a bit like Cersei. The queen has instilled in her son that fear is better than love. And Joffrey is proud that, with a crossbow to her face, being beaten and stripped by men, he has made Sansa afraid. She fears me, Joffrey boasts, and Tyrion's retort that, a pity Stannis and Renly aren't twelve-year-old girls as well, is a typically succinct and cutting remark that well and truly beats Joffrey, as well as providing the reader with some much-needed humour. Some of the dynamics evident in this scene are expanded when the Hound visits Sansa at the Blackwater and when Tyrion and Sansa marry in A Storm of Swords. Yeah, this scene is very important for Sansa, who, despite subtle maneuvers, is still at this point a classic damsel in distress. And other than the aforementioned gestures from Sandor, Tyrion's intervention marks the first time anyone's really stuck up for her since her father's death, remembering there was crowd watching her latest humiliation. Being privy to Sansa's internal monologue, 
We know how damaged she's now become at Joffrey's hands. Her entire worldview of romanticized idealism has been turned inside out. Yes, it has, and she's completely disillusioned at this stage. And previously, we had learned of Joffrey's killing a hungry beggar. And we learn of another incident where he unleashed a storm of arrows against another starving crowd, this time telling them they had his leave to eat their dead. Which is Joffrey's version of political PR? The hunger and unrest continue to spread, and on the way back from Mycella's departure for dawn, the king and his entourage find themselves surrounded by a crowd. It's rare that we see Joffrey held accountable for his various sins, given his status, and whatever you think are the root causes of this unrest, I think we can all agree that Joffrey and Cersei's inept leadership facilitated matters to a point of crisis. Yeah, Joffrey killing the previous protesters showed how out of touch he was as a leader. His life of privilege and his lack of empathy have made him a very ignorant ruler, highlighted by his implication that the hungry should simply resort to cannibalism and his lack of concern that such treatment of the small folk could cause further unrest. When a starving woman holds her dead baby before him, he looks to run her down before Sansa said something in his ear. He's completely oblivious to the danger he and his party are now in, something which the astute Tyrion picks up on right away. When the crowd of angry and starving people cry brotherfucker to Cersei, reflecting on his own illegitimacy, it's clear that Joffrey should be applying diplomacy. Instead, he does the opposite. Yeah, as dung is thrown into Joffrey's hair, a typically humorous moment interjected into an otherwise dark scene. The king wants instant revenge, which provide the final spark to set the crowd off into a riot. Who threw that? Joffrey screamed. He pushed his fingers into his hair, made a furious face and flung away another handful of dung. I want the man who threw that! He shouted, a hundred golden dragons to the man who gives him up. He was up there, someone shouted from the crowd. The king wheeled his horse in a circle to survey the rooftops and open balconies above them. In the crowd, people were pointing, shoving, cursing one another and the king. Please, your grace, let him go, Sansa pleaded. The king paid her no heed. Bring me the man who flung that filth, Joffrey commanded. He'll lick it off me or I'll have his head. Dog, you bring him here. And later, I want him, Joffrey pointed at the roof. He was up there. Dog, cut through them and bring. A tumult of sound drowned his last words. A rolling thunder of rage and fear and hatred that engulfed them from all sides. The crowd then demand bread, calling Joffrey a bastard, and some shout for Rob or Stannis. Joffrey's reign's three biggest threats thus far, starvation, his illegitimacy, and an invasion, all culminate in this scene, to which Joffrey responds with instinctive violence. Upon the outbreak of the riot, Joffrey flees, running someone down, who could have been a man or woman or a child, Tyrion observes. Joffrey's first words, when safe, are... Traitors! I'll have all their heads! I'll... Yes, and this is where Tyrion slaps Joffrey for the third time, recalling the first two in A Game of Thrones, and blames the riot on his nephew. You set your dog on them. What did you imagine they would do? Bend the knee meekly while the hound locked off some limbs? You spoiled, witless little boy. You've killed Clegane, and gods know how many more, and yet you come through unscratched. Damn you! And he kicked him. It felt so good he might have done more, but Sir Mandon Moore pulled him off as Joffrey howled. Yeah, Joffrey's actions caused so much trouble for other people. In this instance, it's frustrating to see him get away with it, yet Tyrion does his best to provide some retribution. Of course, slapping the king so his crown falls off and treating him like this raises the tension between Joffrey and Tyrion to an all-time high. 
It's very interesting to see Joffrey through Tyrion's eyes because we get a true sense of how unintelligent the boy really is. And notice that Joffrey has a big problem with perceived traitors. From Ned Stark to the early offenders he punished in the throne room to the entire crowd here, whether justified or not, it's clear Joffrey has it in for traitors. And there is perhaps an air of Aerys Targaryen's paranoia in that mindset. So the Bread Riot had many victims, Preston Greenfield of the Kingsguard, Sir Aaron Santagar, and the High Septon are killed, Lollis Stokeworth is gang-raped, and Tyrek Lannister goes missing completely amongst the carnage. Joffrey seems wholly unconcerned, more fixated on the mob of traitors, to even notice that Sansa is missing, who as a hostage equates to the life of Jaime. Sansa is thankfully saved by Sandor, to the relief of Tyrion, who soon after learns that the commoners blame him even more than Joffrey. It was Joffrey who told them to eat their dead, Joffrey who set his dog on them, how could they blame me, says Tyrion, upon realising that he is the embodiment of a bad omen amongst the small folk. Overall, the bread riot brought an element of realism to Joffrey's reign and added much-needed vulnerability to his character in the lead-up to Stannis' invasion. The Battle of the Blackwater is the climactic moment of the Clash of Kings, something which we'll be covering in depth soon in our War of the Five Kings episodes, but for now we can focus on Joffrey's role in the battle. Tensions between Tyrion, Joffrey and Cersei continue to rise, and as the imp tries to mastermind the defence of King's Landing, Joffrey decides he would like to be a part of it. While at first this pleases Tyrion, as the king should be seen on the battlefield in his opinion, Cersei responds by mistaking Alalia for Shay and warning of her doom if any harm befalls Joffrey. And on the night of the invasion, Joffrey has Sansa kiss his new blade called Heart Eater. This isn't too long after Sansa has flowered, and remembering that Joffrey had spoken of getting her with child, in this context, the forced kiss of the sword carries a definite sexual menace. His promises to gut both Stannis and Rob are typically laughable from an established coward, and Sansa thinks mockingly towards him in her own internal monologue. Yeah, I think we're all a little bit scared of Joffrey wielding Heart Eater, aren't we? Yeah, hopefully that one doesn't end up in the river. And we later get to see Joffrey's dismay at seeing his fleet burn. And Tyrion has to repeatedly pull down the king's visor to protect him after Joffrey keeps lifting it. A sure sign of his naivety and inexperience in battle. Finally, Joffrey occupies himself by flinging people to their doom with catapults known as the Three Whores. Joffrey dishes his own brand of justice to the traitorous so-called antler men, having already ordered antlers to be nailed to their heads before having them stripped naked and flung right over the walls. In a moment of medieval war, this might not be a completely inappropriate way to treat very real treason and is actually something Stannis contemplated during the siege of Storm's End in Robert's Rebellion. These men were actually scheming to empower Stannis after all, but what sets Joffrey aside is just how much he enjoys and relishes this kind of cruelty. It says... Joffrey hurried off happily to see to it. Yeah, it really seems like Joffrey simply wants to play. He doesn't show any signs whatsoever of martial prowess or military stratagem. And he might only be 13, but compare him to his sire, Jamie, one of the most promising swords in the land from an early age, to his official father, Robert Baratheon, the man who overthrew the Targaryen dynasty, or to his grandfather, Tywin, another revered military mind. Joffrey seems unrelatable to these three men, his primary male influences in military matters. 
In fact, he's more akin to Cersei, who seems as deluded in her own self-concept as Joffrey is, seeing herself as being a warrior if only she was born male, which might just be as ridiculous as Joffrey threatening to personally kill Stannis and Rob. This obsession with killing his enemies in single combat is no doubt a symptom of his yearning to emulate Robert, whose defining moment was his single combat victory over Prince Rhaegar Targaryen. But as luck would have it, when Stannis reaches the city gates, Cersei has Joffrey withdrawn back to the Red Keep for safety, with no regard for troop morale, and with many gold cloaks fleeing as a result. Being mothered this way on the battlefield speaks volumes to who Joffrey really is at this point, still very much more the boy than a man. Despite a heroic defense organized by Tyrion, it's the arrival of Tywin with the Tyrells that saves the day for the Lannisters, and Joffrey's uncle is left to retreat back to Dragonstone. Yeah, without this timely intervention, Joffrey would have faced certain death from Stannis. As it goes, his reign continued, But as we'll see in our next segment, Tywin's arrival will once again shake up the dynamics in King's Landing. And Tywin is not a man to suffer fools gladly. There's also a great feast and a day of monumental celebration coming right to King's Landing. So reserve your table for the 77 course meal. Your Grace... I have a maiden sister, Marjorie, the delight of our house. She was wed to Renly Baratheon, as you know, but Lord Renly went to war before the marriage could be consummated, so she remains innocent. Marjorie has heard tales of your wisdom, courage and chivalry, and has come to love you from afar. I beseech you to send for her, to take her hand in marriage, and to wed your house to mine for all time. Following the Battle of the Blackwater, King Joffrey presides over a crowd in the throne room, giving out honours. That the king had made an early retreat or that Tyrion had been a hero is never mentioned, creating a sense of injustice as Joffrey names Tywin savior of the city and hand of the king. After support from the small council and the high septon, he sets Sansa Stark aside and takes Marjorie Tyrell as his betrothed to the delight of the lords and ladies in the hall. And Tywin is an immediately imposing figure entering on his war horse, and we see right away that Joffrey had better start behaving around him. Here's a quote. The Lord of Castley Rock made such an impressive figure that it was a shock when his destrier dropped a load of dung. Joffrey had to step gingerly around it as he descended to embrace his grandfather and proclaim him saviour of the city. So, Tywin is given all the credit for the victory, while Tyrion, gravely injured and still recovering in his sickbed, isn't even mentioned. Back in A Game of Thrones, Tywin had sent Tyrion to King's Landing, charging him to rule and to curb Joffrey and those who were giving him bad or foolish counsel. His mandate from Tywin was clear and sweeping, and yet upon Tywin's arrival in the capital, Tyrion is demoted and disempowered, not even given credit for what he had accomplished in those months he was in charge. Soon Joffrey is administering punishments to the captured rebels who continue to call him an abomination and he leaves a scene when he rather amusingly cuts his arm on the Iron Throne and he quote, fell into his mother's arms. So clearly the Iron Throne is becoming an uncomfortable seat for Joffrey in more ways than one, providing yet another point of comparison to Mad King Ares who was always cutting himself on the throne. And of course, as ever, his doting mother is there for him. Lord Tywin continues with the proceedings without the young king, reminding us who really is in charge now. And as we'll see, the loss of power makes Tyrion extremely vulnerable to Joffrey going forward, leading to a number of bitter confrontations that would ultimately have an extremely negative impact on Tyrion's arc. There's also a spillover to Sansa here, where previously she had two champions, in Tyrion and Sander Clegane, who both had some type of influence over Joffrey. 
At this point, however, Sander has gone AWOL and Tyrion is powerless, and so she too is left vulnerable, a position that will soon be exacerbated by other newcomers. That's right, because along with Tywin, there's now an influx of Tyrells to add to the changing dynamics. Sansa, who had dared to believe she might be finally rid of Joffrey, is later warned by Dontos in the castle Godswood. If he wants you in his bed, he will have you. Only now it will be bastardy plants in your womb instead of true-born sons. It's there that the fool gives her the hairnet, which he enigmatically calls vengeance for your father and shares with her the plan to help her escape on Joffrey's wedding night. This ends Sansa's point of view chapters in A Clash of Kings, offering the reader hope at the end of the book there that Sansa's torment will end soon enough. Moving into A Storm of Swords, Sansa is now counting down the days until Joffrey's wedding. It says there was nothing to do until then but endure. And with the threat of sexual violence against her already well established and continuing in this book, the reader's concern for Sansa acts as a further tension device in the countdown to her proposed escape. So the arrival of the Tyrells and an informal matriarchy initially gives us further hope that Sansa's situation is going to improve. Despite ultimately playing Sansa like a pawn, Olena and Marjorie are at least far, far nicer than Joffrey on the surface and are soon inviting Sansa to share tales of her woes. I want you to tell me the truth about this royal boy, said Lady Olena abruptly. This Joffrey. Sansa's fingers tightened around a spoon. The truth? I can't. Don't ask it, please. I can't. I, I, I... You, yes. Who would know better? The lad seems kingly enough, I'll grant you. A bit full of himself, but that would be his Lannister blood. We have heard some troubling tales, however. Is there any truth to them? Has this boy mistreated you? And then further on. But how kind is he? How clever... Has he a good heart, a gentle hand? Is he chivalrous as befits a king? Will he cherish Marjorie and treat her tenderly, protect her honour as he would his own? And despite Sansa initially speaking kindly of Joffrey, she soon breaks into terror, recounting some of Joffrey's treatment to her, and tells Olena that Joffrey is a monster. He lied about the butcher's boy and made father kill my wolf. When I displease him, he has the king's guard beat me. He is evil and cruel, my lady. It is so, and the queen is well. Lady Olena Tyrell and her granddaughter exchanged a look. Ah, said the old woman, that's a pity. Yes, it is a pity for Joffrey, and it's quite possible that Sansa has sealed Joffrey's fate there in that clandestine conversation without even realising it, albeit with the knowledge that the hairnet was already in the cards. Anyway, at the least, it proves Olena was researching Joffrey and would have undoubtedly reached the conclusion that he would be a threat to Marjorie on a long enough timeline. Olena adds that Mace is set on Marjorie becoming queen, and so in hindsight there was only ever going to be one solution to the Joffrey conundrum. For Marjorie to be queen and to be safe, Joffrey had to die. And as Sansa is left to daydream about Highgarden and Willis Tyrell, Tywin formed other plans. After Sansa tells Dantos of the secret plans of the Tyrells to spirit her away from King's Landing, and Dantos' secret patron Littlefinger alerts the Lannisters, she is wed to Tyrion in haste. And at the ceremony, Joffrey, as ever, is eager to torment her. It says, Joffrey himself was waiting for her on the steps of the castle sept. The king was resplendent in crimson and gold, his crown on his head. I'm your father today, he announced. You're not, she flared. You'll never be. His face darkened. I am. I'm your father, and I can marry you to whoever I like, to anyone. You'll marry the pig boy, if I say so, and bed down with him in the sty. His green eyes glittered with amusement. Or maybe I should give you to Illin Payne. Would you like him better? 
Yeah, with his distaste for both Sansa and Tyrion, Joffrey seizes this opportunity to torment and humiliate both of them, culminating in a threat to bed Sansa at his will. Tyrion, whose primary weapon, wildfire aside, will always be his tongue, replies that he will geld the king, causing shock amongst onlookers. And it was only Tywin's intervention and apology on the imp's behalf that resolved the situation. With Cersei watching on and essentially enabling Joffrey as she often does, this scene, and indeed marrying Sansa to Tyrion, injected some extra tension between the four of them as Joffrey's wedding approaches. And it was obviously important for the greater story to have Tyrion publicly threaten his nephew. Yeah, because of course the vulnerability of both Tyrion and Sansa in the wake of the Blackwater contributes not only to increased antagonisms with Joffrey, both public and private, but ultimately to assumptions of their guilt following the Purple Wedding. But more on that later. So the next time we see Joffrey is after the Red Wedding, which we covered exhaustively in our recent Rob episodes. Tyrion enters the Han Solar, where Cersei, Tywin, Kevin, Pycelle, and Joffrey are all gathered. Joffrey is childishly excited at the news of Rob's demise. He wants Rob's head to present to Sansa on his wedding night for her to kiss. By now, such sickening threats come as little shock or surprise to the reader, and perhaps on a meta level, this is a potent hint that his time is nearly up. Once again, Cersei acts as an apologist, calling the threat a jape, But Joffrey insists it's no joke. Yeah, Joffrey's excitement has emboldened him further, and he seems almost hyperactive in the scene. Unfortunately for Joffrey, Tywin is present once again, exuding his authority. He offers a word of caution, alluding to Joffrey behaving like Ares, before offering some curt advice about forgiving enemies. Joffrey, when your enemies defy you, you must serve them steel and fire. When they go to their knees, however, you must help them back to their feet. Elsewise, no man will ever bend the knee to you. And any man who must say, I am the king, is no true king at all. Ares never understood that, but you will. When I've won your war for you... We will restore the king's peace and the king's justice. The only head that need concern you is Marjorie Tyrell's maidenhead. And for a character who's had so much unbounded power, this is a rare disciplining for Joffrey, and he does not take it well, immediately sulking. Here's the scene. You talk about Ares, grandfather, but you were scared of him. Oh my, hasn't this gotten interesting, Tyrion thought. Lord Tywin studied his grandchild in silence, gold flecks shining in his pale green eyes. Joffrey, apologize to your grandfather, said Cersei. He wrenched free of her. Why should I? Everyone knows it's true. My father won all the battles. He killed Prince Rhaegar and took the crown while your father was hiding under Casterly Rock. The boy gave his grandfather a defiant look. A strong king acts boldly. He doesn't just talk. Thank you for that wisdom, your grace, Lord Tywin said, with a courtesy so cold it was like to freeze their ears off. Sir Kevin, I can see the king is tired. Please see him safely back to his bedchamber. Pycelle, perhaps some gentle potion to help his grace sleep restfully? Yeah, Bicel recommends dream wine, and in spite of Joffrey's insistence that he doesn't want any dream wine, Tywin agrees with Bicel and sends them away. So if we needed any more proof of Joffrey's boyish immaturity, that he has failed to become any kind of man or leader in the three novels since his introduction, then being sent to bed by his grandfather is surely it. As despicable as Tywin can be, with Cersei struggling for control in her ineptitude and Tyrion increasingly the target of Joffrey's aggression, the Lion of the West is the only character to stand up to Joffrey effectively in A Storm of Swords. The mention of Marjorie's maidenhood in a scene that further exposes the king as a boy reminds us of the upcoming test to his manhood. 
Sadly for him, it's a test he never gets to take. Joffrey brought Widow's Whale down in a savage two-handed slice onto the book that Tyrion had given him. The heavy leather cover parted at a stroke. Sharp, I told you, I am no stranger to Valyrian steel. It took him half a dozen further cuts to hack the thick tome apart, and the boy was breathless by the time he was done. Sansa could feel her husband struggling with his fury as Sir Osmond Kettleblack shouted, I pray you never turn that wicked edge on me, sire. See that you never give me cause, sir. Okay, so it's time for Joffrey and Marjorie's wedding. We're going to analyze this in two parts. First, we'll walk through the pertinent chapters, and then later we'll have a section where we try to piece together exactly what happened, which will contain more detective work. Okay, Joffrey and Marjorie married on the first day, not just of the new year, but of the new century. Clearly a suitable time for some change, and also, incidentally, the day Rob Stark had appointed for his campaign to retake the North from the Ironborn to begin. The day's events stretch across four chapters, alternating between Tyrion and Sansa. We begin with Tyrion watching his wife dreaming as he leaves her. She dreams, he thought, when Sansa murmured something softly, a name perhaps, though it was too faint to say, and turned onto her side. We've noticed that the next chapter sees Sansa waking from a dream, so it's no doubt the same one that Tyrion is observing before he left. And we can guess that it had been Lady, or perhaps one of the names of her family, that Tyrion had watched her murmur, given she'd been dreaming about them, it says. So, interesting little overlap there, adding to the continuity and flow of the sequence. And Tyrion has sex with Shay while Sansa sleeps on, and we later see Shay with Sansa. The, quote, insolent looks that Sansa perceives from Shay are no doubt due to her relationship with Tyrion. And soon there's mention of the breakfast in the Queen's Ballroom, which will be followed at Evenfall by the feast in the throne room. A thousand guests and seventy-seven courses, with singers and jugglers and mummers. And breakfast is exuberant, with an excess of food, musicians, and even our first look at Sir Dontos of the day, a penny for his thoughts at this stage. Anyway, after the meal, Cersei gives Joffrey the wife's cloak he would wrap around Marjorie's shoulders. It is the cloak I donned when Robert took me for his queen, the same cloak my mother, Lady Joanna, wore when wed to my lord father. And in case you've missed what's between the lines here, Cersei is giving Joffrey a Lannister cloak that she wore to her wedding, not the Baratheon cloak Robert gave her to replace it. This is Cersei presenting Joffrey as a Lannister, and it's something that doesn't escape Olena Tyrell, who comments on it in the run-up to the Tom and Marjorie wedding. And then it's time for wedding gifts. Joffrey receives all manner of gifts. And at this point, Sansa notices that he plays a gracious kink today. And the word play there, insinuating Sansa now clearly understands Joffrey's occasional courtesy is essentially an act or a falsehood. She's immediately proven correct when Tyrion presents a huge, gorgeously illuminated book on the lives of four kings, which doesn't impress his nephew. Dynamics soon resemble Tyrion and Sansa's wedding, with Joffrey seeking to humiliate them in front of a sycophantic court. Despite the threat to impregnate his wife, Tyrion guards his tongue this time and drinks instead. This is the first sense of danger of the day, and the notion of continuing from the Sansa Tyrion wedding doesn't bode well. No, it does not. And the scene is interrupted by the introduction of one of the key items of the day. Mace gifts Joffrey a large golden chalice. Tyrion thinks, the damned thing's as tall as I am, before adding, half a chalice and Joff will be falling down drunk which works as an important observation and foreshadowing of Joffrey's demise. 
Marjorie and I shall drink deep at the feast, good father, says Joffrey, perhaps playing into someone's hands. Next is another important item. Tywin gifts a Valyrian steel blade to Joffrey, who, mature as ever, uses it to immediately slice up Tyrion's book. As a voracious reader, how George must have loved making one of his primary villains a book hater, meeting his doom on the same day as destroying a lovely rare book. Joffrey shows no remorse when he's told of the book's scarcity, and George likewise shows Joffrey no remorse later on. Joffrey's threat to Sir Osmond that he better never give him good cause to use his new blade is typically laughable, but Widow's Whale, as it came to be known, gives added danger to the dynamics with Tyrion and prompts a Valyrian steel confession all in a few swoops, and more on that later. The stage is then perfectly set for the main event. The new crown that his father had given the faith stood twice as tall as the one the mob had smashed, a glory of crystal and spun gold. Rainbow light flashed and shimmered every time the high septon moved his head, but Tyrion had to wonder how the man could bear the weight. And even he had to concede that Joffrey and Marjorie made a regal couple as they stood side by side between the towering gilded statues of the father and the mother. The wedding itself is a continuation of the exuberance and luxury witnessed at breakfast. The king, Tyrion thinks, appears splendid with his bride, and for all his many faults, Joffrey knows how to look regal. Tyrion notes how his golden crown rests well against the gold of Joffrey's hair, and with Tyrion now pegging Joffrey for the cat's paw, the colour of his hair represents yet another injustice brought to the reader's attention at the right time. With the illegitimacy, the cat's paw, the cruelty to Sansa, Tyrion, and any number of other wrongs carried out by the king, the reader can be forgiven at this stage for wishing for his demise. And the cloaking ceremony continues without incident and is followed by a kiss and the declaration by the High Septon that Joffrey and Marjorie are one flesh, one heart, one soul. Tyrion wonders who will protect Marjorie against his nephew's cruelty and immediately thinks of Loras in the Kingsguard, a promising warrior. Soon after, Olenna is described as tottering with her cane and in no way threatening by appearance. And after a, quote, beautiful ceremony, where Tyrion realises the common folk love Marjorie so much that they will now accept Joffrey, Tyrion says to Sansa, Would that I'd contrived some mission to take me out of the city. Littlefinger was the clever one, which perhaps foreshadows what's right around the corner for the Stark girl. And later in the yard, as Sansa performs the necessary courtesy, she is paid a visit by Lady Olenna, again portrayed as a tottering old woman. The wind is bent at your hair, though, the little old woman reached up and fussed at the loose strands, tucking them back into place and straightening Sansa's hairnet. I was very sorry to hear about your losses, she said as she tugged and fiddled. Your brother was a terrible traitor, I know, but if we start killing men at weddings, they'll be even more frightened of marriage than they are presently. There, that's better, Lady Olenna smiled. So, there we see the Queen of Thorns fiddling with the hairnet that Dontos had given Sansa. And soon, Joffrey and Marjorie enter the throne room on white horses, with red petals strewn before them. This chapter is incredibly descriptive. Even by his standards, George goes to great pains to convey the atmosphere, the clothing, the food and the music. It's truly an occasion for the senses of riches and grandeur. Part of the reason for this is to contrast with the Red Wedding, which featured questionable food, awful music, an overall unpleasant atmosphere, and tensions of a different sort. Given the weddings have similar outcomes and are in the same book, George obviously wanted to set them apart. 
and Joffrey begins the grand feast of 77 courses with a toast to his wife. And after many courses and songs, Tyrion notes that Joffrey is rather drunk. The king orders out his royal jousters. These jousters turn out to be a pair of dwarfs, and with Joffrey's drunkenness becoming more pronounced, we the reader can sense trouble for Tyrion. The dwarfs are a source of great amusement for the wedding guests, particularly Joffrey, who is seen snorting wine from both nostrils. Yeah, that's quite an amusing visual there. And it really says everything about Joffrey, that on a night that should be about love and his new wife, he makes it about hate and Tyrion, as he orders his uncle to mount a pig. The retort that the king should in turn mount a dog, as he's the only person Tyrion is sure of defeating, which, of course, is like a red rag to drunken Joffrey. Then we get this. Tyrion turned in his seat. Joffrey was almost upon him, red-faced and staggering, wine slopping over the rim of the great golden wedding chalice he carried in both hands. Your grace was all he had time to say before the king upended the chalice over his head. The wine washed down over his face in a red torrent. It drenched his hair, stung his eyes, burned in his wound, ran down his cheeks and soaked the velvet of his new doublet. How do you like that, imp? Joffrey mocked. So, tensions continue to mount between Tyrion and Joffrey, and this is yet more unapologetic public humiliation. Marjorie tries to reseat her husband, but Joffrey first orders Tyrion to be his cupbearer, screaming at his uncle to pick up the giant chalice and fill it with wine. The unbearable tension in the scene is momentarily dampened when the pie is brought out, ready to be cut by the king. And Joffrey uses Sir Illyn's longsword to cut the pie with Marjorie, at which point Sansa realises something must have happened to ice, as otherwise the headsman would still be wielding it. This is a poignant and timely reminder of the destruction of House Stark by House Lannister for the reader, as well as a very telling observation in light of the appearance of a brand new Valyrian steel sword in the possession of the Lannisters in the previous chapter. Yeah, if the reader didn't already suspect where Tywin had found the medal for Joffrey's new sword, Sansa's observation seems almost to confirm it. Anyway, to the roar of delight, the pie crust is broken, with white doves flying from the pie in every direction. Tyrion attempts to leave, but is ordered to bring the chalice, which Joffrey had left on the table as he went to cut the pie. Joffrey drinks from the chalice deeply as Marjorie tries to return to their places. And then Joffrey takes a handful of Tyrion's pie and begins to cough as he crabs another fistful. After taking a swallow of wine, Joffrey starts to choke, still insulting Tyrion as he does so. I want to see... (coughs) You ride that (coughs) pig, uncle. I I want... His words broke up in a fit of coughing. And no amount of wine helps Joffrey as he chokes and chokes with chaos ensuing around him. Marjorie reacts, Olena screams for help, Garland pounds him on the back, Mace barks orders. The Tyrells are in full flow, but it's no use. A fearful, high, thin sound emerged from the boy's throat, the sound of a man trying to suck a river through a reed. Then it stopped, and that was more terrible still. And then... Joffrey began to clod his throat, his nails tearing bloody gouges in the flesh. Beneath the skin, the muscles stood out hard as stone. Prince Tommen was screaming and crying. He's going to die, Tyrion realised. Yeah, this gruesome scene is compounded by this shrieking Cersei crying, My son! My son! And Tyrion looks into the boy's frightened eyes for one last time. Joffrey's death is denoted by Cersei's anguish. When he heard Cersei scream, he knew that it was over. I should leave, now. Instead, he waddled toward her. His sister sat in a puddle of wine, cradling her son's body. 
Her gown was torn and stained, her face white as chalk. A thin black dog crept up beside her, sniffing at Joffrey's corpse. The boy is gone, Cersei, Lord Tywin said. He put his gloved hand on his daughter's shoulder as one of his guardsmen shooed away the dog. Unhand him now, let him go. She did not hear. It took two Kingsguard to pry loose her fingers, so the body of King Joffrey Baratheon could slide limp and lifeless to the floor. The chapter ends with Cersei asserting that Joffrey did not in fact choke, but was poisoned by Tyrion, who had been seen mindlessly pouring away the remaining wine from the chalice. The events of these chapters are known as the Purple Wedding in the fandom, but not in-universe, the purple being a reference to the so-called amethysts in Sansa Serna. And so, Joffrey Baratheon finally leaves the story as one of the rare characters that seems without greyness, a solid villain who showed no signs of remorse for his actions and had little or no redeeming qualities. Early on, we mentioned that the story of Joffrey ultimately asked the troubling question, how much can we cheer the death of a 13-year-old boy? And it's here, rather than in any character greyness, that George finds conflict for the reader. Yeah, in a sense, George is testing our own moral compass by creating such an undoubted monster and ending his story with him clawing at his own throat, his mother cradling him and wailing, and all at such a young age. The reader can feel excused for a feeling of emptiness upon witnessing Joffrey's fate. This was not the satisfying ending to his story many of us were hoping for. As Joffrey lay looking at Tyrion, he was a defenseless boy. At the same time, there's relief that there'll be no rape of Sansa by Joffrey, no more humiliation of Tyrion, or no more tortured cats— in this way, the reader's own heart is in conflict, that kind of instilled uncertainty that George tries to recreate over and over through this saga. And we've dug up two interviews with George where he discussed the death of Joffrey and this conflict that we've just mentioned. The first is from Entertainment Weekly. Joffrey's death was in some ways a counterweight for readers to the death of Rob and Catelyn. It shows that, yes, nobody is safe. Sometimes the good guys win. Sometimes the bad guys win. Nobody is safe and that we are playing for keeps. I also try to provide a certain moment of pathos with the death. I mean, Joffrey, as monstrous as he is, Joffrey in the books is still a 13-year-old kid. And there's kind of a moment where he knows that he's dying and he can't get a breath. And he's kind of looking at Tyrion and at his mother and at the other people in the hall with just terror and appeal in his eyes. You know, help me, mummy, I'm dying. And in that moment, I think even Tyrion sees a 13-year-old boy dying before him. So I didn't want it to be entirely, hey ho, the witch is dead. I wanted the impact of the death to still strike home on perhaps more complex feelings on the part of the audience, not necessarily just cheering. Hmm. And then there's this from Rolling Stone, where we've redacted the poisoner's name, given we'll be looking at the mystery in the next segment. I think that's an interesting question of redemption. That's more like killing Hitler. Does the poisoner need redemption? Did the poisoner kill Hitler or murder a 13-year-old boy? Or both? Is that a case where the end justifies the means? I don't know. That's what I want the reader or viewer to wrestle with and to debate. Okay, so interesting thoughts there from the author, who clearly enjoys inducing a certain amount of debate between us and within us. To summarise the character of Joffrey, as a king, he was hopeless. As a military commander, he was non-existent. As a political operator, he was talked of as a pawn as early as A Game of Thrones by Littlefinger. And as a person, he was undoubtedly a monster. 
Ultimately, we can attach any number of psychological diagnoses onto Joffrey, narcissist, sociopath, psychopath, but we must remember in our judgment, in contrast to the story of his old adversary, Rob Stark, that Joffrey Baratheon died a boy. And coming up next, we'll be looking at the Purple Wedding again as we try to ascertain who did what and when in the plot to assassinate Joffrey. But first of all, here's a reading from the wedding. The king's chalice was on the table where he'd left it. Tyrion had to climb back onto his chair to reach it. Joff yanked it from his hands and drank long and deep, his throat working as the wine ran purple down his chin. Marjorie said, My lord, we should return to our places. Lord Buckler wants to toast us. My uncle hasn't eaten his pigeon pie. Holding the chalice one-handed, Joff jammed his other into Tyrion's pie. It's ill luck not to eat the pie, he scolded as he filled his mouth with hot spiced pigeon. See? Mmm, it's good. Spitting out flakes of crust, he coughed and helped himself to another fistful. (coughs) (coughs) Dry, though. Needs washing down. Joff took a swallow of wine and coughed again, more violently. (coughs) (coughs) His words broke up in a fit of coughing. I want to see... (coughs) Marjorie looked at him with concern. Your grace? I want to see... (coughs) See you ride that (coughs) pig, uncle. I I want to... (coughs) Joff took another drink, or tried to, but all the wine came spewing back out when another spate, (coughs) coughing, doubled him over. His face was turning red. (coughs) It's the pie! The the pie! The chalice slipped from his hand, and dark red wine went running across the dais. (coughs) He's choking! Queen Marjorie gasped. Her grandmother moved to her side. Help the poor boy, the Queen of Thorns screeched in a voice ten times her size. Dolts, will you all stand about gaping? Help your king! (coughs) Sir Garland shoved Tyrion aside and began to pound Joffrey on the back. Sir Osmond Kettleblack ripped open the king's collar. A fearful, high, thin sound emerged from the boy's throat. The sound of a man trying to suck a river through a reed. Then it stopped. And that was more terrible still. Turn him over! Mace Tyrell bellowed at everyone and no one. Turn him over! Shake him by his heels! A different voice was calling. Water! Get us some water! The High Septon began to pray loudly. Grand Maester Pycelle shouted for someone to help him back to his chambers to fetch his potions. Joffrey began to claw at his throat, his nails tearing bloody gouges in the flesh. Beneath the skin, the muscles stood out hard as stone. Prince Tommen was screaming and crying. He's going to die, Tyrion realized. He felt curiously calm, though pandemonium raged all about him. They were pounding Joff on the back again, but his face was only growing darker. Dogs were barking, children were wailing, men were shouting useless advice at each other. Half the wedding guests were on their feet, some shoving at each other for a better view, others rushing for the doors in their haste to get away. Sir Merrin pried the king's mouth open to jam a spoon down his throat. As he did, the boy's eyes met Tyrion's. He has Jamie's eyes. Only he had never seen Jamie look so scared. The boy's only thirteen. Joffrey was making a dry, clacking noise, trying to speak. His eyes bulged white with terror when he lifted a hand, reaching for his uncle, or pointing. Is he begging my forgiveness, or does he think I can save him? Cersei wailed. No! Father, help him! Someone help him! My son! My son!
Okay, so the death of King Joffrey there at this so-called purple wedding. Now we're going to review Joffrey's death once more, this time from a more investigative standpoint, as we try to unravel what actually happened on the King's wedding day. First of all, as we did when we covered the Red Wedding, we want to consider any hints, clues or foreshadowings contained in the text before the event. Yeah, and there's a fair amount to discuss, especially when trying to decipher what exactly happened to Joffrey. In this sense, we have a good old-fashioned whodunit. Yeah, I like the sound of that, so let's get to it. So first of all, we have the introduction of the hairnet at the end of A Clash of Kings. Dontos gifted this to Sansa after talking of a rescue on the night of Joffrey and Marjorie's wedding. As if the gems set into the net, quote, black amethyst from a shy, the rarest kind, a deep true purple by daylight, weren't suspicious enough, Dontos follows up by telling Sansa that the net is lovelier than you know, sweet child. It's magic, you see. It's justice you hold. It's vengeance for your father. Dontos leaned close and kissed her again. It's home. So the reader should have wondered here, as early as Clash, what was going to happen on Joffrey's wedding night and what role this mysterious hairnet would play. This was at the end of Clash, but it's actually at the very beginning of that book where George starts his preparation work for this mystery. The gems on the hairnet shine purple by day, and in Maester Crescent's prologue, we get this. A dozen crystals, no larger than seeds, shone like jewels in the candlelight, so purple that the maester found himself thinking that he had never truly seen the color before. Yeah, this is the poison that kills Crescent, called the Strangler. Purple crystals once again. And as we're going to see, there's a fair amount of exposition for this mysterious poison in the Crescent prologue. And later in A Storm of Swords, we get an allusion to purple poison in Sansa's hair. The ghost of High Heart foresees this. I dreamt of a maid at a feast with purple serpents in her hair, venom dripping from their fangs. And a close examination of Joffrey's and Crescent's deaths highlight clear similarities. Here's Crescent. Crescent tried to reply, but his words caught in his throat. His cough became a terrible, thin whistle as he strained to suck in air. Iron fingers tightened round his neck. And here's Joffrey. Sir Osmond Kettleblack ripped open the king's collar. A fearful, high, thin sound emerged from the boy's throat, the sound of a man trying to suck a river through a reed. Then it stopped, and that was more terrible still. So notice the high, thin, whistling sound coming from both of them as they die. Yeah, they do look very similar when you see them side by side. Okay, and Cersei's immediate suspicion was of murder. He did not choke. Cersei's voice was as sharp as Sir Ilan's sword. My son was poisoned. And regarding the post-mortem, it says... They had opened King Joffrey's noble corpse as well. They swore and found no morsel of pigeon pie nor any other food lodged in the royal throat. It was poison that killed him, my lords. And when Tyrion is inevitably tried for his nephew's death, we get this from Tyrion and Pycelle. Pycelle, Tyrion called out, risking his father's wrath. Could any of these poisons choke off a man's breath? No, for that you must turn to a rarer poison. When I was a boy at the Citadel, my teachers named it simply the Strangler. Yeah, the Strangler again. So now we can safely discount any notion that Joffrey just choked. But readers still wonder if it was the wine or the pie that was poisoned. Here's a quote from the Crescent Prologue about the Strangler. Dissolved in wine, it would make the muscles of a man's throat clench tighter than any fist shutting off his windpipe. They say a victim's face turned as purple as a little crystal seed from which his death was grown. 
but so too did a man choking on a morsel of food. Yeah, it's a perfect fit and confirmation that the strangler is a poison you dissolve in wine. And it seems that this poison simulates choking and so can give the impression of a natural death. In interviews, not only has George confirmed it was the strangler that was used, he said this, The poison that is used to kill Joffrey is one that I introduce earlier in the books, and its symptoms are similar to choking. So a feast is the perfect time to use this thing. I think the intent of the murderer is not to have this become another red wedding. The red wedding was very clearly murder and butchery. I think the idea with Joffrey's death was to make it look like an accident. So there you have it. The idea was obviously to poison the wine with the strangler, and given the abundance of food at the feast, it might appear that Joffrey choked to death, or perhaps cast enough doubt to get away with it. Okay, so with confirmation in another interview that it was indeed the strangler used, and with the strangler being a poison dissolved in wine, as stated in the text, there really is no doubt whatsoever that poisoned wine killed Joffrey, and that the perpetrator had that goal in mind. Any notion of a poisoned pie we consider debunked, and all theories leaning on this to be false. This can all be gleaned from the text, and also has George's word in further support. We've heard strange theories such as it was Tywin poisoning the pie, or that the hit was aimed at Tyrion since it was his pie, but theories like this are really non-starters because there's so little doubt that it was the wine that was poisoned, and George has stated that the intended victim was Joffrey. And furthermore, we have confirmation that the poison came from the hairnet, as most readers would have figured out by now from the text, but here again is George's word. The conclusion that the careful reader draws is that Joffrey was killed by the Queen of Thorns using poison from Sansa's hairnet, so that if anyone actually did think it was poison, then Sansa would be blamed for it. Sansa had certainly good reason for it. And he's also mentioned that it's possible he has surprises left to reveal, which was spoken with the air of possibility rather than promise. Anyway, as the ghost of High Heart foresaw, Sansa did unknowingly have purple serpents in her hair and was effectively being used by the Tyrells to carry the poison and to take the blame if necessary. This is a continuation of the theme of Sansa being treated as a pawn in other people's games, and we'll have a little more to say about the political background of all this scheming here in our upcoming War of the Five Kings episode. Okay, and we can pinpoint in the text when the poison is taken from Sansa's hair. We mentioned this earlier. You look exquisite, child, Lady Elena Tyrell told Sansa when she tottered up to them in a cloth of gold gown that must have weighed more than she did. The wind has been at your hair, though. The little old woman reached up and fussed at the loose strands, tucking them back into place and straightening Sansa's hairnet. And not long after the events, Peter Baelish will make note of this to Sansa as they discuss the wedding. I will wager you that at some point during the evening, someone told you that your hairnet was crooked and straightened it for you. And by this time, Sansa has long since worked out that her hairnet carried death in its stones. For a moment, she wished Shay was there to help her with the net. When she pulled it free, her long auburn hair cascaded down her back and across her shoulders. The web of spun silver hung from her fingers, the fine metal glimmering softly, the stones black in the moonlight, black amethysts from a shy. One of them was missing. Sansa lifted the net for a closer look. There was a dark smudge in the silver socket where the stone had fallen out. A sudden terror filled her. Her heart hammered against her ribs, and for an instant she held her breath. Why am I so scared? It's only an amethyst, a black amethyst from a shy, no more than that. It must have been loose in the setting, that's all. It was loose, and it fell out, and now it's lying somewhere in the throne room, or in the yard. Unless... 
And in hindsight, we can see that Olena fiddling with the hairnet makes perfect sense, and so does the Tyrell gift of the large chalice, which would encourage Joffrey to become inebriated and provide poisoning opportunities with easy access to the vessel. Yes, so Olena is the prime suspect. She no doubt handled the poison on the wedding day and had good cause to kill Joffrey, a good motive. Mace was apparently set on his door to becoming queen, and so this was the perfect opportunity to allow that ambition whilst nullifying the threat of Joffrey to her granddaughter. Whilst it seems very unlikely Mace would be let in on the plan, with Elena saying early on in Storm that, of course, Mace has no hint of our true purpose. Littlefinger was an accomplice and may have procured the unusual poison given his trading contacts. He later admits to being responsible for the dwarf jousters, knowing that they would cause trouble between Joffrey and Tyrion, which, in hindsight, was a bit of a masterstroke. Yes, it was. But the final burning question is about who, if anyone, helped Olenna on the day. George openly talks of Olena being the perpetrator now, but with some possibility there's more to be uncovered with this mystery. It's worth considering who actually put the poison in Joffrey's wine. Yes, so we'll take Olena as prime candidate number one for reasons already stated. But Garland was also sat close to Joffrey, and the key line is here after the cutting of the pie. The king's chalice was on the table where he left it. Yeah, so while it's unclear where Olena was in that time, and if she was mobile enough to do the deed, Garland was stated to be close to the table and probably could have moved quite quickly. Poison being a woman's weapon is an early premise put forward in the text, but we guess it's possible Garland lent a hand at a crucial time. And another possibility is Marjorie herself. She was obviously very close to Joffrey and would have had the best access through the evening to that chalice. However, she seemed to be very busy cutting up the pie when the poisoning most likely occurred. And it would also be a huge risk by Elena to have Marjorie handle the poison herself and take that risk. Yeah, that's true, and so Elena still seems like the pick of the bunch, but we wouldn't completely rule out a helping hand. And what's interesting about Marjorie, presuming she didn't do the poisoning, is that she might have known it was coming. She had to know when the poison was in the chalice, or else there was a risk of her drinking from it. So either a risky strategy from Elena there, or else Marjorie knew what to expect and was being very cautious. If there is a remaining twist about the poisoning... This could be it. So, Olena in the throne room with the poison wine is our final verdict. And there is a small amount of wiggle room, we think, for variations on that conclusion. But not much, given the textual evidence matched up with the author's word. And hopefully we've cleared up a few things for some of you today. Ultimately... Tyrion would bear the blame, because this is Westeros and not an episode of CSI. His own public antagonism of Joffrey, coupled with Sansa's obvious motive to hate a long-time tormentor and her flight from the capital in the wake of the murder, made him extremely vulnerable to Cersei's accusations. As usual, he took the blame in a bad situation in part because it's easy to blame someone who is physically grotesque in so many people's eyes and because Tywin failed to support him. Though we'd point out that had Tywin lived, he may well have found it a lot easier to manage Tommen than Joffrey. Anyway, our final word on the Purple Wedding is about historical influence. Here's George on the inspiration. I based it a little on the death of Eustace, the son of King Stephen of England. Stephen had usurped the crown from his cousin, the Empress Maud, and they fought a long civil war, and the anarchy in the war would be passed down to the second generation, because Maud had a son, Henry, and Stephen had a son. But Eustace choked to death at a feast. People are still debating a thousand years later. 
Did he choke to death or was he poisoned? Because by removing Eustace, it brought about a peace that ended the English Civil War. Eustace's death was accepted as accidental, and I think that's what the murderers here were hoping for. The whole realm will see Joffrey choke to death on a piece of pie or something. But what they didn't count on was Cersei's immediate assumption that this was murder. Cersei wasn't fooled by this for a second. She never believed it was an accidental death. We think it's always interesting to see where George gets his historical inspiration, and we hope you listeners like to hear it. Anyway, that was our forensic look at the murder mystery of the Purple Wedding, and we really hope that you guys enjoyed it and perhaps have a clearer overview of all the evidence now. But fans of theorising, stay with us, because up next is a similarly close look at the mystery of the Cat's Paw Assassin. Dear listeners of Radio Westeros, our late king, Joffrey Baratheon, first of his name, was extremely fond of aiming his crossbow at hares. Fortunately for fans of potted hair, he caused dozens of the animals to be released into the castle grounds, but was largely unsuccessful at shooting them. At Podrick Payne's Pot Emporium, we specialise in the finest pots in which to prepare your daily meal of this culinary delicacy. King Joffrey may be dead, and Lord Littlefinger fled, But thanks to Littlefinger's advice to our founder to invest in pots, their memories live on at our shop, where our motto is, eat potted hair thrice a day. Podrick Payne's Pot Emporium, because you can never have too many pots when your castle is overrun with hairs. Okay, and now it's time for some more theorising as we discuss... Who hired the cat's paw assassin in A Game of Thrones? This mystery from early on in the books has been hotly debated for years in the fandom. In A Storm of Swords, there is an in-universe resolution that left many fans confident that this case was closed. However, plenty of readers found the solution that Joffrey had been behind the cat's paw to be too circumstantial in a world full of unreliable narrators. They found it somewhat unsatisfying, and so to this day, the topic is still debated. Yeah, and there are now three leading theories that we'll be discussing. Crucially, we have a comment George made in a fan correspondence in 2000 that seems to give enormous weight to one of the theories, but what we thought we'd do is explore the theories first because they're all interesting and have their own merits. We'll ask you listeners to choose your preferred theory before we reveal what George has said on the issue. So hopefully some fun for you all, and it's an intriguing mystery regardless of the outcome, so we hope you enjoy our Guide to the Cat's Paw. Okay, so... Bran was lying comatose when the Winterfell Library was set on fire. This seems to have been done as a distraction, and as everyone raced to fight the fire, an assassin entered Bran's chambers, only to find Catelyn. It says, You weren't supposed to be here, he muttered sourly. No one was supposed to be here. He was a small, dirty man in filthy brown clothing, and he stank of horses. Catelyn knew all the men who worked in their stables, and he was none of them. He was gaunt, with limp blonde hair and pale eyes deep sunk in a bony face, and there was a dagger in his hand. And to answer Cat's protest, the man claims it's a mercy and that Bran is dead already. With a dagger, he tries to cut Catelyn's windpipe, leaving deep scars on her hands when she shields herself. Bran's direwolf Summer saves the day and tears the assassin's throat out. Ooh, and Sir Roderick pays close attention to that dagger, and after studying it, he concludes that the assassin must be a cat's paw, meaning someone else ordered the hit. Here's what the Master at Arms says. We found the knife still in the villain's grasp. 
It seemed to me that it was altogether too fine a weapon for such a man, so I looked at it long and hard. The blade is Valyrian steel, the hilt dragon bone. A weapon like that has no business being in the hands of such as him. Someone gave it to him. And combined with the clandestine letter from her sister Lysa purporting that the Lannisters had killed John Arryn, and the realization that Jaime pushed Bran from the tower, Cat now suspects Lannister involvement in the Cat's Paw. She travels to King's Landing to convey to Ned what has happened, and it's there that Littlefinger recognizes the dagger as his own. There's only one knife like this in King's Landing, he says, before telling the tale of how he lost the blade in a bet with... The imp, said Littlefinger, as Lord Varys watched her face. Tyrion Lannister. Yeah, Littlefinger claims Tyrion had bet on Sir Loras, who beat Jaime Lannister in the joust at Joffrey's name-day tourney. And this, of course, leads Catelyn to seize Tyrion, who claims he's never seen the blade, and all hell breaks loose with the Starks and Lannisters, and so Cat's actions here are a catalyst for the War of the Five Kings. And the mystery is still flowing into Clash, where the captured Jaime states that Tyrion would never have bet against his own brother, and so could not have won the blade, as Littlefinger had said. Here's what Jaime says. Whatever my brother wagered, he lost. But that dagger did change hands. I recall it now. Robert showed it to me that night at the feast. Hmm. And in Storm, Tywin lets Tyrion know that Robert had a hundred daggers in his collection. So an interesting connection emerges with him. The insinuation being that with so many daggers at his disposal, losing track of just one might not actually be unlikely. So someone who visited Winterfell with Robert could now be a candidate. And at his wedding, Joffrey receives a Valyrian steel blade, which he soon names Widow's Whale. He has a fair old time dicing up Tyrion's gift of a book, shouting, Sharp! I told you, I am no stranger to Valyrian steel. Yeah, and this proclamation, given Joffrey is not known to have any prior experience with Valyrian steel, leads Tyrion to offer a new gift to his nephew to replace the ruined book. Perhaps a knife, sire, to match your sword. A dagger of the same fine Valyrian steel, with a dragon bone hilt, say. And it says, Joff gave him a sharp look, perhaps indicating some flash of cognition or suspicion on his part. And we think that it's no accident this happens mere hours before Joffrey's death. It's all part of the build-up to the end of his arc. The entire sequence is later laid out in Tyrion's own point of view. I am no stranger to Valyrian steel, the boy had boasted. The Septons were always going on about how the Father above judges us all. If the father would be so good as to topple over and crush Joff like a dung beetle, I might even believe it. He ought to have seen it long ago. Jamie would never send another man to do his killing, and Cersei was too cunning to use a knife that could be traced back to her. But Joff, arrogant, vicious, stupid little wretch that he was. He remembered a cold morning when he'd climbed down the steep exterior steps from Winterfell's library to find Prince Joffrey jesting with the hound about killing wolves, Send a dog to kill a wolf, he said. Even Joffrey was not so foolish as to command Sander Clegane to slay a son of Eddard Stark, however. The hound would have gone to Cersei. Instead, the boy found his cat's paw among the unsavory lot of free riders, merchants, and camp followers who detached themselves to the king's party as they made their way north. Some poxy lackwit willing to risk his life for a prince's favor and a little coin. Tyrion wondered whose idea it had been to wait until Robert left Winterfell before opening Bran's throat. Joff's most like. No doubt he thought it was the height of cunning. The prince's own dagger had a jeweled pommel and inlaid goldwork on the blade, Tyrion seemed to recall. At least Joff had not been stupid enough to use that. Instead, he went poking among his father's weapons. Robert Baratheon was a man of careless generosity and would have given his son any dagger he wanted— but Tyrion guessed that the boy had just taken it. 
Robert had come to Winterfell with a long tail of knights and retainers, a huge wheelhouse, and a baggage train. No doubt some diligent servant had made certain that the king's weapons went with him in case he should desire any of them. The blade Joff chose was nice and plain. No gold work, no jewels in the hilt, no silver inlay on the blade. King Robert never wore it, had likely forgotten he owned it. Yet the Valyrian steel was deadly sharp, sharp enough to slice through skin, flesh, and muscle in one quick stroke. I am no stranger to Valyrian steel, but he had been, hadn't he? Else he would have never been so foolish as to pick Littlefinger's knife. The why of it still eluded him. Simple cruelty, perhaps? His nephew had that in abundance. Okay, so Tyrion playing the Columbo there. And really, he lays out a very solid case for Joffrey being the culprit. But unfortunately, he comes up short on this essential motive, a vital part of any crime solving. But when Cersei and Jaime discuss the catspaw, she remarks that a drunken Robert had alluded to giving Bran a mercy. We kill our horses when they break a leg, and our dogs when they go blind, but we are too weak to give the same mercy to crippled children, he told me. He was blind himself at the time, from drink. And Jamie realizes that Joffrey was there to hear Robert say this and wonders if the boy, desperate for a pat on the head, could have arranged the assassination as a misguided attempt to curry favor from his father. Let's not forget that Joffrey does have a history at misguided attempts at impressing his father. That story of the kitchen cat is exactly that. Anyway, Tyrion and Jamie briefly discuss the case when Tyrion is escaping from King's Landing, and the pair settle on Joffrey being the culprit. In story, this provides resolution to a fantastic mystery that glides through the early story like thread through a needle. Yes, such a central part of A Game of Thrones. It's great to follow the thread of the cat's paw mystery and the domino effect it has on the surrounding plot. However, as we mentioned before, there are some fans who continue to argue that this is not in fact a shut case. And so we're going to take a look at the alternate ideas now. Naysayers point to the evidence about Joffrey being too circumstantial and the conclusion that a dead character is responsible being unsatisfying and perhaps in some way a cop-out. Given Joffrey will never have to confess or take any responsibility for his crime. And the two main schools of opposition come from ideas that the assassin could have been sent by either Littlefinger or Mance Raider. Okay, so first let's consider Mance. We consider this a curveball or out of the box somewhat, but there is a really interesting case to be made, and we want to shout out Azad Ninja, who laid this out on Reddit a few years ago. Okay, so in Storm, we learn that Mance had been at the Winterfell Royal Feast held for Robert's arrival. It says, The wall can stop an army, but not a man alone. I took a lute and a bag of silver, scaled the ice near Longbarrow, walked a few leagues south of the new gift, and bought a horse. All in all, I made much better time than Robert, who was travelling with a ponderous great wheelhouse to keep his queen in comfort. A day south of Winterfell, I came upon him and fell in with his company. Free riders and hedge knights are always attaching themselves to royal processions in hopes of finding service with the king, and my loot gained me easy acceptance. He laughed. I know every bawdy song that's ever been made, north or south of the wall. So there you are, the night your father feasted Robert, I sat in the back of his hall, on a bench with the other free riders, listening to Orland of Old Town play the high harp and sing of dead kings beneath the sea. I betook your lord father's meat and mead, had a look at Kingslayer and Imp, and made a passing note of Lord Eddard's children and the wolf pups that ran at their heels. 
Okay, so Mance's motive would have been to come over the wall to observe his enemies, and in doing so, perhaps to foment unrest. He has a huge army north of the wall, and wouldn't relish facing Robert's army if the wildlings did happen to beat the Night's Watch and find themselves on the south side of that wall. So sending the cat's paw for Bran would have been an opportunistic attempt to cause trouble between the major houses of Westeros and provide a distraction for Mance's planned invasion. Being a wild thing, perhaps giving Bran a mercy would fit his worldview. Or would Mance never dream of doing such a thing? The choice is yours. In in the idea's favour, Mance left for Winterfell with a bag of silver. Rob tells Cat that the cat's paw had 90 silver stags in a leather bag buried beneath the straw. Of course, in the stables, that's why he smelt of horses. It's clear that some of that money was for Mance to get a horse south of the wall, but could he have used some of that silver to pay for the cat's paw? Well, Mance also blending in with camp followers is another neat fit, as it would give him opportunities to get close to Robert's royal wagons and steal the king's blade, and that would cause more trouble for Robert. The notion of guest right is more worrisome for the theory, as Mance puts great stock in it, citing his relief when he'd eaten at Winterfell. He could have left Winterfell and ended the right before the assassination, but it's worth mentioning that Mance relied on honor to protect him at Winterfell, which speaks for his character and how his mind works. Okay, so that's the Mance Raider Catspaw theory. Hope you liked it. And now on to Littlefinger. Peter Baelish is a known player of the Game of Thrones, who could have tried to cause trouble in Winterfell from afar. He could have hired someone to do their worst between the Starks and the Lannisters, with the assassin realising the optimum way to do that was to kill Bran with a dagger found in Robert's armoury. Littlefinger is a master player, no one doubts that, and this would have been just one in a series of master strokes aimed at empowering himself and leaving Winterfell in a vulnerable position. There certainly is a lack of direct evidence with this theory, instead relying on Littlefinger's connection with the dagger, his inherent cunning and selfish motives, and the implication behind the appearance of the mirish lens and message from Liza in Lewin's study that Baelish did have an agent in the King's party somewhere. Okay, so that's three very different theories on the Cat's Paw Assassin, and we hope you like them because we actually think all three are very interesting and thought-provoking. However, there can only be one, and we'll ask you listeners to pick the one you think is most likely to be true, Joffrey, Mance, or Littlefinger, and perhaps you even have your own alternate crackpot. Yeah, and as we said at the beginning of this section, we do have a correspondence from George from 2000 when a fan asked him about this mystery. We think that it gives an overwhelming weight to one of the theories, and so here it is. Yeah, a fan wrote to George before the release of A Storm of Swords and said, You should know that even after all this time, we're still debating things like who was behind the assassination attempt on Bran. And George's response was, I will tell you that A Storm of Swords will resolve the question of Bran and the dagger, and also that of John Arryn's killer. Some other questions will not be resolved, and hopefully I will give you a few new puzzles to worry at. Okay, so there you have it. The question of Bran's assassination attempt is raised, and George replies that a storm of swords will resolve the question of Bran and the dagger. We checked, and this is an email correspondence with seemingly no margin for errors of translation or interpretation, and save for the remote possibility that there's an error, or if George has changed his mind, it seems to us overwhelmingly that Joffrey had paid the cat spa in a characteristically misguided attempt to impress Robert, who had drunkenly talked of Bran needing a mercy. Yes, we think that's the sensible conclusion there. And we do have to laugh at that fan email, which mentions, and this is in the year 2000, that, quote, 
After all this time, people are still debating the cat sport. And here we are, 17 years later, talking through the theories again. (laughs) And we see this as an unambiguous response from George. If we were talking in betting terms, we would make Joffrey the odds-on favorite. And just one more quote from George that we've dug up. He was asked, Did Littlefinger influence Joffrey to try and kill Bran? And he answered... Well, Littlefinger did have a certain hidden influence over Joff, but he was not at Winterfell, and that needs to be remembered. Yeah, so George pointing out that this long distance between King's Landing and Winterfell should dampen any ideas that Littlefinger in any way directly influenced the situation there. And notice there that George doesn't object at all to the assertion from the question that Joffrey tried to kill Bran. Yeah, but what is interesting about that is that he does confirm that Littlefinger has a hidden influence over Joffrey. And, of course, we're thinking of things back in King's Landing, like perhaps the death of Ned Stark. So, we hope we've given you listeners some clarity on the cat's paw, as we tried to with the Purple Wedding. Are you more sold than ever that Joffrey was behind the attempt to kill Bran, or do you still harbor your own ideas on the issue? Like Mance, or Littlefinger, or Moonboy, for all we know. And that wraps up our look at one of the great villains of the series in Joffrey Baratheon. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed our look at Joffrey Baratheon. When we return, we'll finally be talking all about the War of the Five Kings. It's a massive topic, and we're excited to be presenting it to you as a double episode. So as usual, now it's time for us to give credit where credit is due. Thanks, as always, to George R.R. R. Martin for Song of Ice and Fire, and to Kevin McLeod for allowing us to use his music in our production. And, as usual, we'll end today with thanks for our patrons from the Valyrian Steel and Castle Steel levels. Consider being a patron of the podcast, and you could be hearing your name here, too. Heartfelt thanks to Alexis, Amber, Jessica, Kurt, Joe, Chris K., June, Matt, Aaron, John H., Sir Bobby the Knight, Thrower of the Valyrian Steel Chair, Melitza, Cinder of the Citadel, J.M., Demetrios, Joy B., Maltude, Yorlen, A.U. Packmule, Painkiller Jane, Mary H. of House Stark, Marja the Mage, Lady of the Frostfangs, Rusted Revolver, Lady Steelwind, Sharon of Littlefield, William James, Lord Brandon Brewer of Castle Blackrune, sworn alesmith to House Stark, Grand Master of the Zithomancer's Guild and Keeper of the Buzz, and Lady Dyerliss of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron. And thanks as well to Jim McGeehan of Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire, AJ, Arion, Chris V, Direwolf, Anzonio, Greg, Brendan B. Fish of Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire, John of House Dane, Liz, Marilyn, Princess Sandico of the Summer Isles, Rebea, Lady of the Waves, Steve, Early Bird Gets After It, Zainab, James B, Curveball, Matt M, Jeff Gnarly the Long Snapper, Septus Smashley, Ash E, Rebecca Q, Jean A, Megan E, George K, Yvonne, Sakari San, Black Eyed Lily, Manon, Rachel, Felix, Dion, Brian, Matt L, Michael Y, James M, Rachel Mary, Jose, Michael M, Jason, Tanner, Aiden, Shannon, Jennifer, David Damshorts of the Farallon Islands, Sir Ryan Godwin, Knight of the Kingsguard, Lord Commander Daenerys Flint, Mama J, Mother to Cripples, Bastards, and Broken Ones, and Fabian Flowers, the Bastard of Green Shield. As always, let us know if I've pronounced any of your names wrong, or if you have a nickname you'd prefer to use. Visit RadioWesteros.com for quick access to all our podcasts. You can also find a link to our Patreon campaign, donate via PayPal, and comment on our content there. Or find us on YouTube, and of course you can connect with us via Twitter, Facebook, Google+, or Tumblr. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you soon with the War of the Five Kings. Bye for now.